listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. You're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another day in the booth. Who it's- was that? That was actually Ghostface. That's what Ghost I was going to say. It's Ghost Killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little little fun fun fact. Uh, I'll just intro you real quick. Today we got Mr. Ken Block in the booth. How are we doing, Ken? Excellent. Happy to be here. So yeah. wait, finish that though. Ghost from what? So that was from the U.S. Open in like 2003. Ghostface and the, I, I don't know, a bunch of the Wu-Tang members were there. And they were on stage and they made like a mixtape. And I, I think it's... I, I don't I don't remember the name exactly, but um yeah I think he meant to say Burton snowboard, but he says I'm gonna slide down the hill on a big nice burgundy snowboard. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> I don't know uh, that makes sense. Though. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't I don't know I don't know if you guys ever knew this, but we actually had a dub party in Long Beach with the Wu Tang. Okay. Yeah. So it was one of the ASR trade shows. I want to say I was there. Yeah, it was amazing. That was a good. It was kind of a small venue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Small menu was, right on one of the main roads I was there, there in the middle of Long Beach. That was the only time I saw Wu Tang. Yeah, they were really late, and I had to literally <laughs> drive to the valley at like eleven p.m. to try and get them out of the studio to come to the show. And then the bonus part was they all came. Basically, the the flyer said uh, I think it was Ghost and Raekwon, and then they all showed up. So that was, but they only got to play for like an hour because they showed up at like twelve thirty in the club closed at one thirty. Yeah, yeah, but that was, that was amazing. Those were the fun days, man. ASR and SA trade show parties and life was simpler back then. That well, Wu Tang show was worth every penny because that was everyone was so hyped. Yeah. Well, let's throw it back. Everybody knows you as founder of DC Shoes, Rally Car King. But the early days of snowboarding for you, um, I believe it was like Snow Summit. And then I kind of want to get into talking about, um, you know, Type A and Dub and starting those those smaller brands back in the day before you fully got into DC. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Southern California. I wasn't, I was in Long Beach. I wasn't far from the water, but I never felt a connection to the ocean and my dad had hand built a cabin up in Forest Falls. And Forest Falls is if it's if you go the southern route up the Big Bear, Forest Falls is a little valley that you kind of go up and then go out of to go to Big Bear. Um, and so I, I grew up on the weekends going up into the mountains, enjoying just the mountains themselves in the summer and then the snow in the winter. And I just fell in love with it. So I I, I would much rather be in the mountains than like the ocean ever since I was quite young. So uh, eventually uh, my parents moved us down to North San Diego. It's the Escondido area. I went to high school in Escondido. And uh, at the end of my high school early, like right, yeah, I guess right at the end of high school, uh, a kid that I was good friends with, a guy named Tom Russell, he and I just started watching snowboard videos. We just loved watching the videos. And because I was a skateboarder, I thought, wow, this looks like, skating but on mountains so i i just really wanted to try it so we went one weekend he could snowboard he barely knew how to do it so we just went one night like a friday night to snow summit and i just learned by slamming on the ice at night at snow summit and ever, and that i was hooked ever since then i just been trying to figure out how to keep that feeling that's it do you remember what videos you're watching uh it was like <sighs> I mean, it was late '80s movies like Snow Shredders. Yeah, you know, like the first like movies. Like Burt Lamar and, yeah. and Palmer and uh, that whole crew. You know, Terry Kidwell. You know, so I have a real fondness for that old Sims board with like Kidwell writing yeah. it. You know, Pure Juice or whatever. <laughs> right, and there's like music from that that video. I could still remember. Yeah, like the song "Oh Yeah" by Yellow. I don't know if you. I remember that video. I'll like, have to cue oh, that yeah. up. Yeah, I remember <laughs> yeah. what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and randomly also, like, uh, at the same time, the Blizzard of Oz, the ski movie came out. I remember that. And it was like Warren Miller, but done in a cool way with Glenn Plake and his yep. mohawk and all that. And, it, and it's not, I don't, skiing's not for me. Like, I grew up skateboarding, so standing straight forward was always really foreign to me. It wasn't for me. 
But I liked the movie's attitude and style. and had, like, Frankie Goes to Hollywood type music. Yeah, I remember that it. movie. It was sick. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, like, that, those were the early days for me, and it just, I fell in love with it from there. And I was supposed to, I, I like, studied architecture and all through high school and went to a computer drafting class schooling after after high school. And then I I went to actually do it as a job, and I did it for a year. I was like, oh, my God, this sucks. I hate this. <laughs> so uh, I moved to June Mountain and then to Breckenridge, Colorado with Matt Goodman. Uh, do you know who Matt Goodman is? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, so Matt Goodman is someone I went to high school with. Matt Goodman was best friend. You went to high school with him. Yeah, cool. he was a year younger than me. Uh, but Matt Goodman at the time was best friends with Tony Hawk and Andy Hetzel randomly. Wow. So I, he was living in Breckenridge, so I went out and – uh, lived with him, I think, for a year and a half, two years in Breckenridge, and just snowboard. I was a snowboard bum. Worked at a uh, local like ski shop. Hung out at First Tracks, which was the cool yep. shop in town, and and just did the whole snowboard bum thing. Tried to get good, and really watching Hetzel and Rankwit made me realize, yeah, I'm not I'm never <laughs> going to be good enough to be pro. And so that's when I moved back home and went back to school and. Started working on sort of the marketing area, learning learning how to make T-shirts and design things. And that's when I met Damon Way randomly in an algebra class. And then that eventually ended up being all the companies that we did. Just a random meeting. So Damon Way is Danny, Bra- Danny Way's brother for yes. the people that are unfamiliar. Yes. Um, and at, at what point, because I'm a huge dub fan. Like still to this day. <laughs> Me too. And, and Me so too. <laughs> I, I personally want to talk about Dub and Blunt specifically. Yeah, okay. And how they started and, and that whole deal. Yeah, well, to get there, we have to start. We, we started off doing eight ball clothing, which we, like literally I started in the junior college that Damon and I were at, which is called Palomar College. And I designed everything there we did all our first silk screens there and at the time i was making t-shirts for first tracks in breckenridge and like hobie oceanside and it was just like shops and people that i knew and so that's just how i got started doing that stuff and then that evolved into us making our own stuff and eventually the school's like yeah you got to get out of here you're making too much stuff inside our school you were using their facilities yeah, for yeah. your jobs yeah yeah we were working till like three in the morning like because we're trying to do it in off hours. And finally they're like, yeah, it's cool. You're trying to make a business out of this, but you can't do it here. So, you know, it started off as eight ball. And then there was trademark issues with that. So we moved on and made drawers, which was the skate clothing brand. And, uh, I obviously loved the snowboard and, and Damon did too. So we started making dub because we saw the opportunity to make a skate style brand in snowboarding. Um, and so those were, you know, we were doing drawers as the pure skate line that we had Danny and Colin and Jordan Richter and Josh Swindell, all these guys on the skate side of things with drawers. And then we had Dub with, you know, everyone that was around then. Didn't from, Tarquin ride for? Yeah, Dub. Tarquin had Yeah, style. he was my MF, roommate for MFM. a while. Yeah. yeah. And, and Russell. Uh, yeah, Russell, <laughs> Tarquin. I remember those guys. Like, Tarquin made, like. It helped. He was he was in love with the brand. He was so hyped. Yeah. So that Good was dude. that was a lot of fun. And funny story about all that though is like uh, we were friends with Raul Reese at the time, and he had special blend. So he made our first pants for us with eight ball, and then helped us get dub going. Uh, and eventually, like we would go off and do random you know trips with Raul. Eventually, we ended up not being friends because he was trying to steal Danny and Colin and <laughs> weird shit like that. So, Raul is his own Just story in his own world. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, like that, you know, I appreciate, though, the fact that we had some good help back then because we didn't know how to make snow clothes. So, Damon was trying to figure it out, and we had people like Raul that were actually helping. But it was it was actually really cool because we, we were having fun with drawers doing, you know, the, the core skate thing. Had an amazing team, um, so much help from Danny and everybody to create what we created. But on the snow side, we had a similar thing with a lot of great writers, but we wanted to do something that was kind of fun and different and more of a sort of a hip-hop feel with that. So, you know, I grew up listening to 
new wave and punk rock. But as soon as hip hop really started getting big, I basically was a hip hop and punk rock kid. So, it, you know, my, my all time favorite bands are Biggie and the clash. Like, That's you know, <laughs> so it's, I'm torn sort of in the middle of that, you know? So I, it was fun doing the skate style stuff that was a bit more punk rock, but also hip hop was getting really big in that that scene at that time. So it was fun to then take that and make dub and, and dub was so well received. We had, you know, everyone from Cypress Hill to Wu Tang hitting us up for gear, you know? So it was cool that it was so well received in the snowboard market. Cause we were coming from the skate market making and making that, but we also had, you know, the hip hop market hitting us up and wanting that stuff too. So it was fun. I, look back on those days as like definitely some of the funnest days of my life being creative and doing stuff stuff at a very grassroots level and trying to grow a company and you know damon and i weren't taking any salary it was just putting it all back into the company and just surviving to make the company grow and it it all grew quite well until we finally started dc and that took off but it was it was a cool time period were were you the first I don't know if this is true. Did you guys are the first ones to do that? The wrist skater? Someone was telling me that, but I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I can't. I can't recall that we can claim that. I feel like we might have stolen that from some technical <laughs> ski company. Yeah, but we were probably one of the first to do it in the snow mar- uh, snowboard market. You That's gotta, what someone was saying, but I wasn't sure <laughs> if it was true or not. You got a Patreon question that pertains to this, right? Yes. Um. Yeah. About Dub. Um. You're familiar with Patreon? Yeah. Yeah, we have a nice Patreon, which is really supporting us well. So thank you, Patreon. So uh, this is from uh, Chris Swires. Um, how come they bailed on Dub? It seems like it could have been a brand that stood the test of time, product, team, marketing. Uh, well, we we actually kind of bit off more than we could chew at one point. <laughs> and, like no, because we had... Yeah, well, we had drawers, we had Dub, we had Blunt Magazine, we were part owners in Type A, you know, we, there, and then we started DC, and it was just, it was too much. Something had to give. Yeah, and and none of it was big enough to warrant all its own staff, you know? So Damon and I were basically running everything on the design and marketing side, and it, it was just too much. So when DC started and took off... Uh, we just saw the like potential there and how good the manufacturing was and distribution and just understood that like the scalability of DC was so much better than everything else. So that's when we, we sold everything off to narrow everything down and change the physical name of the company to DC. It was called Circus Distribution. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah which was a name to kind of have a distribution name that then everything was owned under. Um, you know, which which is a good... It's actually a great business formula that, you know, everything from world industries to Etnies has done that. Uh, but we just said, Hey, we see the potential here with DC. So we got rid of everything to focus on that one and it ended up when you were right. being the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually sell the other brands? Uh, yeah. Dub and drawers. We sold to world industries. Uh, uh, blunt was sold in a combo deal. It, it first went to world industries and was sold, to, um, another distribution house. Uh, what else? Type A, after Mike Ternowski died, that ended up kind of being a mess, and we, Damon and I just yeah. let them have that. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, and, and so it was a complicated time, but in the end, you know, we, we had to kind of go with our gut and go with some good advice and just focus on DC, and it ended up being the right decision. It's crazy. Well, before yeah. before we uh, move along and get into DC, uh, we have a guest question from Todd Richards <laughs> that pertains to this era of uh, your life. And the guest question is presented by Solomon. I get asked all the time what bindings I ride. I recommend the Solomon Districts. They got um, shadow fit technology where the, the high back basically molds to your boots. But anyway, can't recommend the Solomon Districts enough. Let's get into the guest question from Richards. Hey Ken, it's your old pal Todd here to ask you a question for the bomb hole. So, 
Throughout your whole career and your life, you've always had like an acute attention for detail, like from the styling of your car's livery to your homes and your offices, everything seems to be perfectly on point and you know, with real attention to detail. So the question that I have for you is, what the hell were you thinking when you decided to put zebra stripes on a GTI uh, <laughs> back in the early days in Breckenridge? And a follow-up question to that will be, what is the grossest thing you've ever found in the hot tub at the Mountain Lab? <laughs> uh... Those are very classic Todd questions. <laughs> Todd talks fast, too. How, huh? how he even remembers the GTI is insane to me. So I had this GTI. I was like, I was like 19 years old or something, 1920. And that's around the time when I moved to Breckenridge. And for whatever reason, I, I was very inspired by Rally. You know, like, so I had this GTI with the head, you know, extra lights on the, on the front bumper, all that sort of stuff. And for whatever reason, I, I wanted to paint white zebra stripes on my head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, stupid kid at 19 years old, you know? So I, I did it and they survived a couple of years and eventually that car died somewhere along the way near the plan B offices in Poway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and his other, what was his other one? The but what you thing? found in the hot tub. Oh God, I, I don't, I'd never looked in there. <laughs> Someone else cleaned that. Yeah, probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely found random, you know, like swimsuits that were apparently taken off. In there. <laughs> <laughs> Legendary times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, diving into DC. Wait, you forgot one. There. You actually asked about Blunt. Yes, Blunt. Oh, yeah. Blunt. Yeah, yeah. So, so the funny thing about Blunt is, uh, you know, I, coming from skateboarding and liking snowboarding, like, I wanted snowboarding to be cool, right? Like, and my skateboard friends would look at it and be like, ah, oh, these guys are whack, you know? Like, they're imitating our tricks and doing it in shitty ways or whatever. And obviously, they respected the guys like Rankwit or Zelastic that were doing it right, right? But then there was a lot of the magazines that were calling tricks name, trick names wrong, and just showing the wrong things and just things you wouldn't see in skateboarding they were doing in those magazines. So I remember clearly I was like in a 7-Eleven like in like Cardiff and I was with Danny and Colin and they we were looking through magazines, you know, at the rack and they were making fun of like one of the snowboard magazines calling a trick wrong, trick name wrong or something. And man, I was just like so annoyed by it that like I was like, all right, I'm just going to have to make, the right magazine. Let me make a skate street style magazine that represented snowboarding the way I saw it. And Big Brother to me was the inspiration because it was the way, it was the right attitude of how we felt about skate skateboarding and then that could be applied to snowboarding too because it was a very similar industry at that time. So that was, that was the real base reason of why I started Blunt. It, I didn't need to make a magazine. There's no money in magazines yeah. <laughs> unless you're the giant magazine. But it was it was just a a passion project. I just loved the sport of snowboarding so much. And we had dub going and type A going and I just wanted to see snowboarding grow, but but grow the right way. You don't want to see it as a cheesy thing that's in Walmart. You want to see it as a dope thing with its own shops and its own culture and done right like how skateboarding was so that's that's a real background behind blunt and blunt kind of took off in its own sort of way and it was a like big brother but it had its a bit of its own flavor it definitely was a copycat of of big brother but i tried to do things a little bit different and it, it was genuinely a fun project and i learned a lot kind of being a editorial director as opposed to only an advertiser so i kind of got to see that world from the magazine side and, and the journalistic development side so it was actually a really good learning experience for me so i it was a struggle like i do i would never do that to myself again but it was a very good it was a very good tool to learn from though to help me become a better businessman for what we are doing for dub and drawers and dc were you pretty hands-on then with the magazine? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I laid out most of it. That's crazy. And I worked with Hosnick and Nate Christensen, everybody to collect the photos and get the stories and get Cody Dresser over and get him drunk and watch him 
the board himself. test. Yeah. <laughs> Those were so sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it was it was a lot of fun. And, and unfortunately, that formula would work great today. Yes. It's like, you know, like a Vice magazine, how they converted to like online content and all that. And that formula, Blunt, that we had would have worked great for that. We were just 20 years too early. You were showing the real side of snowboarding that no other magazine was like, they were too scared to show it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, well, it was just, you know, if if you understand corporate culture and where all that money comes from and you're trying to please the advertisers and all that, yeah, you don't get Cody Dresser and yeah. shrunk in your parking lot <laughs> and let him try and break snowboards. I don't know. <laughs> or try and teach kids how to clip tickets, yes. which was one of our <laughs> pages in one of the magazines. I remember Genius. a quote from one of the magazines. It was like a MFM quote on a Sweden trip where it was like definitely pregnant and that was just the quote. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just stuff like that. <laughs> it was like MFM in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> just awesome stuff like that. I mean, that was my favorite magazine. That I mean, I should say Snowboarder is my favorite magazine <laughs> since I work for them. But, <laughs> but uh, no, Blunt was it. Well, you know, the thing that was fun about that is is highlighting the writing the way that we saw it, like street style writing back then. And then also the photography, like I'm really into photography. So being able to lay out those spreads the way that we wanted and show the snowboarding the way that we wanted was really kind of a critical fun thing for me to do. And uh, I don't know, I, I, there's so much in snowboarding that can be very gnarly. Devin Walsh, you know, jumping out to one of those big stumps to 180 out or, you know, I love that stuff. So to be able to showcase that when the other magazines weren't. They weren't quite there yet, huh? Right, you know, and, and that was just a really cool era of snowboarding to be a part of because we were watching it go from, like, this thing where Kemper snowboards and all these, like, Euro brands were out there uh, hooger booger, yeah, you know, hooger literally booger. a brand named hooger <laughs> booger. You know? And but we got to see all these cool brands come in in the in the nineties from you know from the Santa Cruz and Joyride that yeah, sort Joyride. of stuff up to all the way Forum and and all those brands. So it was great to see that formula and what worked in skateboarding then applied in a new way and and done really well. Yeah, I, I really admire that too, as as well as like being a, a kind of proud to be a snowboarder. And you see stuff, and you're like, dude, that's not it. You're making us look bad. You're making us look whack. And to just kind of be like, no, we're just this is how you do it. And then you're like, you know, that that's sets the the building bro- blocks for people being kind of proud to be a snowboarder and making it is what it is today. Yeah, there, there, there's a there's a funny thought process there. Like you you don't want to see the sport you love done in a cheap way available at Walmart. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that's why I think a lot of skateboarders and snowboarders take a lot of pride in, in like not only the trick and style that comes from things, but also even the graphics that go on the boards to the ads, to the innovative ways that videos are done. It's a culture. And I know it's a weird, I fucking hate that word. It's a weird word to say, but it, it, it really does like, have an atmosphere that carries all the way across, you know? And, and it's like, you guys, I got to sat down with you guys. I haven't sat down with you guys before, but we all have a commonality of like things we know in the history videos that we like, you know, uh, particular writers, you know, so there's a commonality there, but there's also a level of expectation. Like if you see something whack, you're going to call it out as whack. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? But I think that's based on our expectations and what we perceive as the level that we want snowboarding and skateboarding to be respected at. So, you know, they're, they're, being in skateboarding for so long and doing DC, there was always this thing of what's a sellout, you know? And even for us to go from skateboard shops to mall stores, it was you know, a big deal back in the early 2000s. But, you know, skateboarding was getting popular and you had to bridge that gap or else somebody else from the other markets was going to drop down and take that sales. So it was hard. It was a, always a tough discussion for us in-house to try and figure out what what does make sense for us to be able to share this industry and what we love, but do it the right way in the market as the sport becomes more popular. But at the end of the day, we want 
the Beastie Boys to like our stuff. We want Adam Sandler to be calling us and want our product because it's cool. We make cool stuff in a cool industry. And if the industry wasn't cool, if skateboarding wasn't cool, then our product, therefore, wouldn't be cool. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship that all kind of works together. Mm-hmm. Well, I, we do need a certain standard. At the end of the day, as much as, like, skaters, snowboarders, we're haters. Like, we're haters, you know, but like there, there needs to be, there needs to be a standard. Like not everything can fly, whether it's visually, graphically, trick wise. Um, and, and then to kind of change gears right now. Wait, wait, wait. I, I like, I like what you're saying though. That Yeah. So I, I, one of my business partners, Brian, he and I discuss it. Like if seven, if somebody is at some percentage of dick, if you aren't like 30% dick, I don't trust you, <laughs> 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 but, it, but it's, it's because we're all critical, right? Like, we're critical of the content we make. We're, I'm critical of my driving. I'm critical of how I snowboard. I'm critical of what I wear when I snowboard. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so there's a certain criticalness to it. You can call it hating. There are certain people who are like, dude, you're too much of a hater. Like, <laughs> right? that's 90% dick. Right? <laughs> so it all depends on the level of percentage of that hate. But I think a certain part of that's good. It, it's just to us... If you look at it more as like a, a criticalness because you have standards, then it the hate kind of term kind of goes away a little bit. But, True, <laughs> but it makes sense though. You you got to have a certain standard of what you expect in life, what what you're willing to take from friends, like, and what you're willing to pay for. So, yeah, if someone makes some graphic that's really dope, I I want to buy that. I want, I'm, or if I can, I'm jealous that I can't have that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> But that's that's that level of like expectation. That's that level of standard, and that's that's what kind of makes these cultures what they are, right? And that also sets like why certain athletes, you know, from Jamie to Danny Davis, get the respect they have because of what they do. They're setting a standard for their riding and how they represent snowboarding. They, that they get that respect that they're put in that place. That's well said. Yeah, I do love the fact that uh, in a lot of things that we do, respect is coincides. It comes with skill set, be it whether you know in graphic designer or, or or in your writing. You can't just come in and, and you don't just get a seat at the table. You have to you have to kind of like be good at something. Sometimes I look at like I don't know. I look at other cultures. Like for example, like harley culture or something like that like i see a lot of people that buy like motorcycles and there's not really like a a defining factor of what makes somebody good but then you look at like skate and snow or rally it's like simply you have to have a certain skill set in order to gain respect yeah well you can't fake it you can't fake it exactly right and you can't like in the skate and snowboard industry you can't fake the talent you can't fake the style. You can't buy style. Mm-mm. You know, you can't, as a company comes in, you can't fake that you're a cool company because everyone sees right through it. You know, even a shop, like a, if you see a shop, like I saw something on the way here and I'm like, I, I automatically looked at like, who owns that? Like, you know, like, <laughs> I'm already critical of who might be behind it. But, <laughs> just from the look of it. Right, right. But that's, that's the skateboarder in me. I yeah. just, I'm critical of everything. Like even the shop that I go in and buy stuff from, like I have to respect the owner, you know? Or else you're not going in there. Right. It's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like I, growing up in Southern California, like the San Diego area, like I went to Pacific Drive, Jim Ranella, like, I respected him so much as a human uh, and as a skate shop owner. Like I, we, I drove down there with friends, you know, and that's where deer to come out and Kelly bird and all them. And, and it, because the respect that that human had, as far as a skate shop owner, it gravitated everybody to it, you know, but that's, that's how legit and real you have to be in the market to, to, to be a part of it, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, whereas like, yeah, Harley, yeah, you can just go buy one right around. Like yeah, I'm a Harley like, guy. I'm Harley, you know? so I, see that all the time. <laughs> I seen some dudes. I'm like, dude, you were like a tall T skier a year ago. And now you're like a Harley guy. Like, but anyway, um, just to, uh, I really want to get into the DC stuff because I'm, I graduated high school in 2005. So I was basically all of your marketing that you had came up with. 
banged me over the head as a kid. So like the thing that I'm fascinated the most by are those clean DC ads, you know, where it was like, okay, back in the day, it sucks. It's not a thing anymore, but it's like, you know, you could tell people were like, I'm going to shoot my ad. I want it to be banger. And you guys with the black and white photos and just all, I had DC ads on my wall as a kid. And, um, I guess I want to talk about that marketing strategy and the thought behind those clean ads and, and that whole deal. Well, it started with drawers that, you know, I just, we wanted something that looked different. Every, everything that we did, we wanted it to be different. And we always wanted to upscale. We didn't want to downscale. We always wanted to kind of push up. And and uh, Nick Adcock, a guy that ran DC for us after we sold the Quick, had a funny statement along those lines. He would say, perception is reality. So as the way that someone perceives you can be reality, right? So if, if you want to project a certain thing that you're a professional or that you're a professional company, well, you just act that way and people will perceive you that way. And that's the way we really looked at, you know, trying to be a big skate brand was, you know, let's make everybody think we're making the best products. We're going to try and make the best products, but let's put everything on this pedestal from the design of a lace to the, to the video, to the ad, to everything. Let's do it at the highest level. And so we, we set these expectations and we started doing this stuff back with drawers, making really unique ads i mean there's a there's an old ad that comes to mind that really started this off it was deerdick we pulled poured paint over deerdick's head and he's got a cigarette in his mouth and it's really artistic photo shot by nico uh nico akatipis um and just kind of that set a standard for us that we just kept on with after that so trying to come up with these crazy photos after that that just kind of kept going and then from there, that, that just worked. So we just, as dub started to happen, we continued a similar feel. And then as DC happened, we just elevated it even higher. So, but, I, you know, I think one of the main things, though, is like Damon and I were skateboarders. Like, we were in our young 20s. We were skating out front every day, going snowboarding when we could. We're out partying with all the skateboarders that we worked with. We lived the lifestyle. So we were just taking what we did and injected it directly into all the products that we were making. And so it, it made a very high end feel to things, but very authentic at the same time. So it would, it'd be hard to do that if you were just a big company owner being like, here, hire some people to go do this. Yeah, you can't fake that. Right. Exactly. So it was, it was insanely fun. Like those days were insane. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, destroyed hotel rooms and all that sort of stuff. But the the work ethic that Damon and I had, we just pushed each other and really had this high expectation of what we were trying to do. And it, it, it just worked, and we just kept working at it. And we were lucky to not only work with some of the greatest skateboarders in the world, um, but some of the – some very talented people around that from – photographers like Mike Blayback and videographers like Greg Hunt. It's just the team that we had with us was just incredible. So I, you know, Damon and I worked hard, but man, I, I have to give so much credit to so many other people that, that got us to where we were. And so that it, it was fun and it was a lot of hard work, but I wouldn't give it up that history for anything. One era that's beautiful around this time is the love park era with, you know, you had Stevie and you had Kalis and then you also had like the mega ramp and just so much iconic stuff. Uh, and the ring, I wanted to talk about the ring, <laughs> like, cause it made you guys feel like this kind of DC elite group. I, what's the thought process behind the, the ring? You just asked a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of layers. A lot, a lot of layers multi-dimensional <laughs> question. Well, I think that kind of, it goes back to like, our involvement and love of being involved with skateboarding. Like love park was just one of the raddest places of skateboarding. It was a really simple park. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, they were having all the issues of what was going on there at love park with skateboarding and, you know, and Stevie and Kayla loved that place. So we were doing everything possible to try and help make it, you know, happened to keep it open and all that. I mean, there, there was a point that I went to love park with a million dollar check and tried to give it to the city right, that we were going to help them keep the park open for skateboarding by pledging them like a hundred grand a year over 10 years. 
And they, they turned us down. They said no? Yeah, but it was funny, though. We printed out this big check and went there and made our own <laughs> little press conference. You know, but we were we were trying to help. It was a... It was we were genuinely willing to spend a hundred grand of our company money per year to keep this skate park open for skateboarding. So it didn't work, but uh, you know, it was a try. At the same time too, it was around when Deerdick or slightly before uh Deerdick came up with the skate plaza concept and he built designed and had the city of Kettering in Ohio build uh the skate plaza. So we helped with that also and we made a shoe to help raise money for the project, and that was really that was really cool to be involved with because Deerdick's idea there was, you know, t- taking skate parks instead of them just being bowls and really generic sort of basic designs and converting them to something that was more designed around ski- street skateboarding, and so it was an incredible project. So it was very cool uh, to be a part of that because Deerdick, the way the dude thinks. Uh, is just so intuitive and innovative sometimes that like those sort of ideas to jump on one and really be a part of it was really cool for us. Uh, where else did you go? Uh, uh, the, the rings. I the want rings. The rings. The ring, the ring. Yeah. I mean, that, that just comes from like, our, you know, our love of hip hop and like that sort of lifestyle back then. Uh, and and I I definitely wasn't cool enough to be rocking big gold chains or anything. So <laughs> <laughs> so the ring was kind of our way to make something rad of the brand that we could all wear and share like this cool sort of like team mentality, uh, but do it in a, a way that other teams just weren't or wouldn't do it, you know? And it just fit so well. The logo looked so well that way. So every every time an athlete got signed they would they would get a get a ring as part of the contract and then eventually we even had some rings that were like for a certain number of years like five or ten years that sort of thing like a beef special ring like a little more souped up or whatever yeah a little more souped up and had like a number on the side (laughs) or something yeah i mean the funny thing is i actually thought about wearing one today but i'm like i can't even remember where they are <laughs> that would have I just dope. I haven't I haven't worn jewelry in so long as yeah, I, I like either. get older like I'm so afraid of especially around motorsports mm-hmm. like getting my finger caught and something ripped getting off. A, getting a finger ripped off because the rings on so like even my wedding ring that I rarely wear is like carbon fiber so it's super light but it can break if it gets caught in something and hopefully not rip <laughs> not rip my finger off um, but yeah if I, I'd still have a bunch of watches too because I love watches I love. Like the industrial design of watches is something I really love, but I just at a certain point I was like, "This is useless." I have a, a computer in my pocket that tells me the time anytime I want. Like I don't need this piece of jewelry on my wrist. Yeah, that makes sense. So, <laughs> sorry to all you watch <laughs> manufacturers out there from Breitling to Nixon. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> 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 wow so how do you name do you name all the brands or what because you've had some hits out there with the names um yeah most of the names have been mine or like mine and damon's working together i mean dc came from drawers clothing that's what it means yeah. right so at one point we were trying to come up with a name for the shoes and uh it's a it's a process because you're dealing with trademarks so we come up with all these names and i remember one of the names was gray like i like the name gray um and you're, you're just submitting him to a, a trademark attorney, and he's just basically coming back with no, no, nope. no, no, no. <laughs> you know, but I'd, I'd made DC logos before for drawers clothing. It's just an abbreviation that we would make for a front of a T-shirt or something. So I was like, okay, how about DC? Because I, I knew I could make logos for that, and that came back as a yes. So, okay, we're off and running. Now I can make company logos, T-shirts, all that sort of stuff, and and start making the, the logos that go on the shoes. So that's, you know, it, it's it's not an easy process. It really isn't. Um, and even Hoonigan, like that that name I took from the word hoon, which is the word hoon in Australia means reckless driving. Why they chose the word H-O-O-N for reckless the driving? They just have the funniest names for everything right, in Australia. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Like, to me, it's a term of endearment, uh, having fun with a car, you know? <laughs> but there, that literally, like you say, Hoon, it, in their mind, it means reckless driving. So, I've, I'd, which is funny, because I've actually gotten a reckless driving ticket before, and it I was have, a very I negative experience. <laughs> <It sucks>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but to them, that's Hoon. So, I, 
for us, it kind of became of a term of endearment. And even in Australia, it's a bit of a term of endearment, meaning, oh, you were out hooning, means you were out having fun with your car. <laughs> and so we took that and, you know, mixed it to, with, with the word hooligan, just, you know, the I-G-A-N, and added that to hoon. And I thought, oh, I have, I, I have a word now that means having someone that has fun with a car. So very obscure word and added the brackets to it. And I knew that was something that, we could use that would kind of help, you know, do all the marketing that we want to do, make my team gear and all that sort of stuff. So that's an awesome name. Yeah. I have another term in endearment actually that a Patreon person sent us. And, uh, so it's not really a question. This is from Shannon Glenn, but she says, one of the greatest satisfactions in life is Ken blocking something. I fucking Ken block that shit. <laughs> it's a special occurrence. <laughs> only few people know. <laughs> Are you familiar? People use your name to like, you know, when they're drifting or like getting some in a car. Yeah, I I think that's kind of funny. I mean, every everything has their generations, right? Yeah. Of of a moment in time that like you see something and then it means something to you, right? So I that to me, uh, you know, I grew up watching rally cars slide around by, you know, people like Colin McRae, who was like the biggest influence on why I became a rally driver. So to me. It, I, you know, I, I would call it power sliding or drifting coming from the generation I'm coming from. But if someone's the first time they see a car sliding is because Ken blocks in a video doing that, then I, it's easy to see how that's been applied. Yeah, I was pretty stoked when I saw that yeah. come across yeah. the computer. Dude, the yeah. amount of times I've been like, yeah, I just can block that bitch. It's, like, it's a fun, it, your name works good, you know? Some names wouldn't work as good yeah. as that, you know? But um, I definitely want to kind of, I got a couple more questions about DC because that era, you know, it's it's the puffy shoe era too. Yeah, true. And, and I remember, you know, I read for Soul Tech for Etnies in 32, and I would go in there and make fun of the fader, which is their flagship puffy shoe. And and they'd be like, dude, don't make fun of that shoe. That shoe is the reason you have a job. And so I was wondering for DC, those like puffy, I don't know the name of your guys' equivalent of the fader, but the, the kind of the mall uh, puff shoe, you guys must have made so many biscuits off of that <laughs> yeah the funny thing about that is like we we the early part of that is Derek and all those guys were like taking a tongue and cutting it out of one shoe and stuffing it under the tongue of their shoe they wanted to wear double tongue right like, so like that's the old hip-hop flavor right right so that's where the look came from and we're like oh we can just make the the tongue thicker to get that look so we started making them thicker and thicker, and and in the beginning it was, it was stylish and it was well done, and we were adjusting the shoes around that, adjusting the last, which is the thing that the shoe gets formed around when it's made. Um, but at a certain point, like it just got ridiculous, right? <laughs> got to the point where we wouldn't wear it anymore, <laughs> and then at some point, Osiris just took over that crown oh, yeah. yes. and ran with it with <laughs> the really D3. Did. And I think they still are running it out there, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Or they're still selling them somewhere. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that whole story is insane. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen the documentaries with Mayhew and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ASAP Rocky recently took it and made it his own, too. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I have a problem with all that. But anyway, that all started really, uh, you know, with us kind of taking what Derek and those guys wanted to wear and got it to a certain level. And then it just went on and escalated from there. And for us, there were several different shoes, but kind of like the real mall shoe was called the court graphic, had a giant logo on the side, huge puffy tongue, you know, was sold at the mall stores, that sort of thing. And I mean, to me, that's part of the downfall of DC, meaning uh, of like, its style because that shoe became such the known shoe in the mall and it just looked cheesy. It just got, it, they just made a million and a half versions of it and it kept getting kind of cheaper and cheaper. And so it, it, it unfortunately it's kind of a, a demise of your own success, you know, it just got too popular, right? Right, exactly. And so we we all like it the in the marketing side of the company and the design side of the company. We wanted to get rid of that, but it, it's you know the company was addicted to it. It was like fuck, can't, can't like cut it, those numbers, yeah, out. can't <laughs> cut that line, you know, like, yeah. like it just it was too. You know, the reps wanted it, the distributors wanted it. It was just a money maker, and as much as we wanted to diversify 
you know, the line and bring in better designers and, and do things, nothing made as much money as some of those products. So unfortunately, like I said, the, the, the demise of success, success, or whatever. Yeah. But you know, and we, at, you know, at certain points we had incredibly talented people making amazing stuff, but that stuff just didn't sell. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of Buscemi. There's a line of shoes out there called yeah, Buscemi. I like, Buscemi. Yeah, John Buscemi yeah. was our lifestyle shoe designer. Oh, he was. Oh, yes. Wow, I didn't right. know that. Yeah. So, you know, we had really talented people and that worked for us that did that sort of thing that have gone on and done all sorts of different things. And it is what it is. Well, and don't some, give... sometimes the consumer actually dictates where a brand goes, whether you like it or not. Yeah. I mean, that was the style back then. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what are you going to do? I mean, yeah. you created it, I guess. So yeah. Well, the problem is when the style keeps going, but yeah. the core market has gone somewhere else. Starts going skinnier you, shoes. Yeah. You look. Vans couldn't even sell a pair of shoes back then, compared comparatively to DC or Etnies who were making bigger shoes. And I don't want to act like I'm uh, like the Lynx and and some of those DC shoes that Kalis and Stevie were skating is just those iconic shoes incredible shoes but yeah like you look at vans nobody would buy a slip-on back then but they'd they'd buy a you know the, whatever you it know just Kalis cycled is back into van yeah, style so timing. it goes the timing right <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's funny how that worked out because vans really didn't do that well for many years and then all of a sudden like the skinny jeans came back in and kids wanted more like punk rock style shoes and skateboarding and real simple even though you'd break your ankle in these in these shoes, no you know, <laughs> right? No support, and like, yeah, just hurt your feet after a day of wearing them. And but for for Vans' sake, it just came in, and all of a sudden their business just went through the roof without them doing anything. Yeah, like, just cycled yeah. back around. Yeah, they were making the same thing, right? <laughs> and and good for them though. They actually stepped up and and did great collaborations. Had a great team. Did some great videos, and like, I I think that they they capitalized on it, but it kind of just fell into their lap. At least from my perspective. No, I think that's well said. Well, going back to this time period, let's, let's talk like, you know, maybe, I don't know what, how old you'd be at this point, but let's say like the kind of beginning phases of DC, it's like doubling, it's tripling, it's growing rapidly. You're in your mid twenties to late twenties. Like we like to talk about cheddar biscuits on the show, which is increments of money. Like, can you give us an idea of what like ballpark that era, you know, in your twenties, what kind of money you're making from DC? Ah, man, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, honestly, we didn't really start making money till we were probably in our thirties. Like the good, the fun thing about it though, was we were spending money with like car allowances and stuff like that, you know, to where Damon and I were getting better and better cars and he liked Range Rovers. I liked Mercedes, that sort of so stuff. So you'd build a car allowance <laughs> into your salary, right? Your exactly. Salaries or whatever. Exactly. Owner draw. You know, and so, and of course, you know, I had a good budget for, uh, I hate to say the word parting, but it was definitely <laughs> like, <laughs> well, the, but that, that, uh, the, the term sounds a bit more wild than it was, but I mean, we would be on trips and it's like, yeah, let's go to Nobu. Let's take 20 people to Nobu yeah, and, let's treat and have too. a huge dinner and end up throwing sake at everybody and getting kicked out yeah, yeah. You, you know gotta make them feel like they're part of something rad and that's the right. way to do it right and, and, that, and they were and it it was part for us it was part of the lifestyle of, of of the company that we were interacting with the athletes with the retailers with our reps with you know there was a it was a company atmosphere that we were out enjoying life you know and so it's it got a little crazy sometimes i've had to pay for some hotel rooms Including one out of four seasons, um, which was quite expensive. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, do you got a number on that? <laughs> I mean, that one was probably twenty grand. Which was um, destroyed for for our four yeah, seasons yeah. hotel room. I used to drink a lot. I don't drink that much anymore. And it was your room. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you could just write that off to the company. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Marketing damage. <laughs> Yeah, we marketing. About, there is there is a bond form sometimes there with partying. Did you kind of think about that? I mean, like you're saying, you know. Yeah, there's a fine line there, though. At the end of the day, you're spending money as a company and marketing uh, to better the brand, right? Uh, it's capitalism. There's a certain number 
of you know a percentage of what your overall sales is that you then go and spend on marketing or certain expenses for food that sort of thing so there's there's always a a fine line though between like going too far extending things too far that sort of thing and and i I think that's a genuine problem you know I've, i've seen plenty of company owners kind of go too far with that and of course i mean we all know plenty of stories of athletes that have lost control of their their careers because of not being able to control the the partying usages and, and money associated with that in time, you know, mm-hmm. uh, several stories, which I've heard at this desk. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, so the desk of the bomb hole. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that that's, I mean, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, if this was a different rating of podcast, <laughs> um, you know, because it, I've seen so much of it and heard so much of it and it's, it's a part of life. Um, and it just happens to be that the skate and snowboard world is plays by slightly different rules because you don't have to get up and go to practice to, you know, play basketball, you know, against Michael Jordan the next day. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of interesting personalities and they do some wild things, I guess. Huh? Yeah. You know, there are, I mean, there's definitely the contest crowd in, in these, in these sports and you do have to get up and face guys like Torstein and true and, and Terrier, you know, depending on your, your decade. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, that is a definitely a smaller segment of guys that I know in, in these sports because so much of these sports surround are surrounded by the idea of marketing potential. Uh, you know, what tricks guys can do for video parts or for ads or for social media. So the value comes more from the sport itself and the style and what the execution of that than necessarily waking up at 8am to be on the mountain to, to run a contest. Mm -hmm. So that just very nature opens things up to experience life in quite a different way than certain other sports. Yeah. Than most other sports. (laughs) Well, this kind of ties into uh, the sponsored question, right? We get asked all the time, you know, any tips for being sponsored and from your perspective, running these brands, uh, do you have any advice for, you know, an up and coming kid from your standpoint? You know, I get asked that all the time, especially in the motorsports world, because, you know, you can be a skateboarder and, and actually go through years of your life with spending very little money to go do that sport. Uh, but racing a car, I mean, I have a car that like, it, you can't turn it on for less than 10, 10 grand. Really? Yeah. Cause like I have a contract with. Ford that there's got to be a certain level of engineer when that engine starts. So to rent a track, have medical personnel there, my team, the transportation, that engineer coming from the East coast. Yeah. You know, it's that's very cool. expensive. So that's just an example, you know? So even a grassroots motorsports, you know, you're still talking about thousands of dollars in cars and tires and, you know, the fuel and that's just go, go do one event, you know? So the, the, the question of sponsorship, basically my backstory there was the question of sponsorship comes up much more in motorsports because kids, all they can think is like, okay, I have this bill. I have this dollar amount. I know I like to go do this rally one time or even a season is this big number. How do I get someone to help me pay for just some of that? You know? And, uh, you know, the connection of people in people's brains of like, I need money. What do I got to do to get that out of some sponsor is a real easy connection to make, but they don't make the connection a lot of times as to what the company needs. Like if someone's going to give you a dollar out of their marketing budget, they're expecting some sort of return to help sell whatever product they have. And that's where a lot of, a lot of people miss this idea and, and it's a real lack of understanding of life, like how business works. Like it's capitalism. You got to understand that every company here has to somehow fund itself and make money. And the marketing money that then is spent to make that money is then what is used for sponsorship sponsorship. So for someone from a skateboarder, snowboarder to someone trying to race a car, it's like, what sort of value are you bringing to this company? What are you offering to them? What, how are you going to help them sell a product or help them be more successful? And I think if everyone understood that and studied to understand business better, that they would 
it would be better for people to go in and try and understand how to try and get sponsorship out of these companies. Cause it, it really, it is difficult. It is not, it is not easy. It's not easy on either side. Cause on the business side, you look at a budget and you say, okay, well I, I've got to spend this money. There's a marketing manager somewhere in the company and he's got a budget. And if he doesn't spend that budget smartly and grow the company, well, his job could go away. Someone else could replace him. And then you have someone on the other side that's like, I'll take your logo, I'll put it on on my board or my car or whatever because I want to get paid to go do this certain thing. So between those two situations, you've got to come out with something that, that works for both sides. And a lot of times, A, you'll see like, and this was the case back in the day with someone like Nike, they didn't understand our market. So they came in and spent money like in snowboarding and failed in the beginning. Um, and then the other times maybe. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Several times, <laughs> yeah. especially in skateboarding. And then from the other side, you see kids that just don't even know how to approach these people to say, Hey, I, I can, I can help you with your goals because I'm going to do this, this and this, and I can have your logo in front of people or I can speak for you, whatever. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one, but my answer always to those kids is, Hey, I understand business. Like even in the roughest sense, you've got to understand that when you go to talk to someone and ask them for money, you've got to understand what you're talking about. And B, if you can really understand marketing and marketing budgets, that's going to make it, make it so much easier for be able to talk to someone and actually be able to understand what you're trying to get across and how you're trying to communicate and also understand what potential deliverables you can give to them to make the situation work. Yeah, that's one thing uh, people don't realize is I, I feel like if a brand's going to give you, let's say, let's just use 30 grand, right? They're expecting to sell maybe uh, ideally double that in return, right? Like your return on decimal or or at least sell that amount of that amount of product. And what I, I'm curious listening to you talk is can you give an example of somebody who, you know, in skateboarding, I'm sure you've seen a million examples of people not understanding that you paying them a lot of money and them not understanding their job is to sell you know skateboard shoes and and then a great example of how to do that in real life yeah i, I yeah i mean i dealt with a lot of a lot of different situations there but you know there's even guys that we were paying a lot of money to and it was even get them to come in for a meeting at our office with damon and myself and even dyrdek at times because dyrdek was a great consultant for us with marketing it's like hey come in and meet with us one o'clock next tuesday we'd all be in the room waiting for them twiddling our thumbs because they just would never show up. And it's like, dude, we're, you're one of the highest paid athletes in this company and you can't show up for a simple yeah. meeting <laughs> with the heads of the company. It's like, that, that's not a good look. No. You know, it, it, it really isn't. And, and that's, that sometimes was the hardest connection that like you don't, you're, you're getting paid for a service. You're getting paid for us to use your likeness, use your name, but it's a two-way street. We have to be able to work together. I'm just not going to take a random photo of you, and that's the best ad ever. It, it's a lot of times the big campaigns. There's a lot of work behind that, and uh, it it ta it's a two-way street. It takes both of you working together to try and get the best thing, you know. So, you know, certain guys. It was like Derek. I always use Derek as a great example. He just understood that side of it. He's like, "What do you need me to do?" jump down that rail, which was actually a request at one point on a commercial. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <He> says, <laughs> it was a lot of tries for him to do it, but he, he did it. We made a commercial out of it. You know? I remember it, the one specifically that it's square bar, but he, you guys capped it, right? Is it I think one? it was a round bar it was that we capped round bar. it. That's it's what square. I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one Nigel crooked recently, but yeah, back then. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of girls chasing him. Yes, I remember <laughs> that ad. It's iconic. Yeah, yeah. Who, who conceptualized that? Uh, I don't recall. It might have been a, a VP of marketing we had at the time, yeah. but it was probably a group effort. And Dyrdek was really into that idea. It was fun to do. But he's a good example, though. He was there working with us to make that happen, and it was rad. you know. And, and then you have other guys that are just like, hey, leave me alone. I'll make the marketing. you know. And we're like, okay, we trust you. But then if they don't deliver, you're like, uh, hey, uh, you know, we got like a problem here. Yeah, we got a problem, you know, and, and so that that definitely became an issue with with several different people. But, you know, you take the good with the bad. You try to work through it. Um, it is what it is sometimes. But, 
you just try and do the best. Do you think it was their egos or they just didn't understand what was expected of them? Uh, sometimes it was, it was ego. Sometimes it was personality problems. We had guys with depression problems that actually didn't want to be in front of the camera. Oh, you know, I don't want to name any lames, yeah. but there was guys that, that the, the market loved, but it was so hard to get anything out of them. And eventually they, we just wouldn't resign a contract. Cause yeah. just, well, some people don't deal with fame well either. Yeah, they get exactly. Level, they like freak out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and then you had other guys like uh, Danny that would come up with these insane ideas, and it was on me to sign these checks. Uh, you know, For his build, ideas. yeah, to build like the mega ramp. You know, and my my business partners are looking at me like, "What are you doing?" You know, like hundred grand for a ramp, and I'm like, "It'll work out. It'll be great." You know? <laughs> yeah, and luckily it did. It did, like, yeah. You know, like the mega ramp and the the. DC video that we did, I think came out in 2004. And then the, the bonus edition, which was the street obstacles added to the mega ramp. That was insane. Like mm. that was a time I, I will never forget. Like, cause it was so insane going out watching him do that stuff. And then being able to have Greg hunt, one of the best skate film directors ever put it all together and put that out. It was, man, that was an incredible time. You're having Stevie Williams and Danny Way in the same video. Yeah. It's like, dude, you it's not it's never gonna be like that again. I hate to say it. Not to be that old nostalgic guy. But we've been cruising along. We normally hit this earlier, but um you know what part of the show this is? It's uh name that video. Wait, part. can we talk about this real quick? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine. I, I I love music and videos and you know Oh I, yeah, we're doing videos. I, <laughs> talk about the video. Yeah, I like this. Okay. Right, I can tell I've you know, I've at DC, we produced a bunch of videos and like through all the marketing stuff I've done with Hoonigan, it's, you know, music is a, a big part of that stuff. But because the music industry has lost so much money by not selling the music anymore, like they did with, you know, CDs, records, tapes, all that stuff before, like it, the, the, the licensing rates have gone up like this. So, so I, like I, I have trouble now watching certain snowboard movies. Like I'll watch them once and be like, Yep, never watching that one again. Because like, the music can't. is so bad. Yeah, I can't stand the music. Yeah, because like, they can't afford the good music. Yeah, it's literally that bad. And I agree. Yeah, and so I, I you know, just to give you an example, we tried to, we tried to get a certain big name band recently, and recently when I say like three years ago, um, and it was just for like the closing track. Oh, no, it was actually for the Raptor Tracks video that I did at Baldface, right? So we had a certain track we really liked from that, from a big-name band, and I'm friends with the drummer, right? So we have an in. So the, the, we told them the track, working through it. Of course, there's a time crunch because we got to get this video out at a certain time. And uh, the quote came back, and this was only for a certain amount of time because nowadays you want stuff in perpetuity so you can leave it up on youtube forever right mm -hmm. so you want this long time frame well they came back with three years was their length so after three years we'd either have to pay them more or take it down or take it down or replace you'd have to take it down then replace the music then put it back up that sort of thing but the price for this one track for one one four minute edit for that video was 150 grand <laughs> That's a and biscuit. you knew the drummer <laughs> That's anyway, biscuit. yeah yeah and so it just like he was super disappointed. He's trying to help, right? Yeah, but it's but it's not it's, even up to him. But right, it's record execs yeah. that are that own the music. That they this is just a cash cow for them, right? Yeah. It's like, well, licensing's now how we make money, you know. So that's true, well, huh? They're be, not selling albums. To, to be to be like a snowboarder too. You look at you know to me the greatest videos growing up. I mean, you look at like the stuff Pierre did. You know, robot food. Why is it so great? Or even the grenade, you know, for yeah, the me, music. My, the music is so damn good. Even tech, your guys' tech yeah, the music was so the rap good. music. Espe yeah. Especially your guys' DC video. Soundtrack, incredible. Yeah, right? and, it, and it takes a director with certain eye for things and a certain sound for things, right? Because you, you just see certain guys put things together certain ways. And writers do have a lot of influence influence on that. No, no, I want Nas to this. You're yeah. like, it doesn't fit. I don't care. I want Nas. <laughs> I want Nas. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it, it is what it is when it comes down to writers and that sort of thing. But I, I think like Pierre with Robot Food and what he did with us with the Mountain Lab videos, he, he had a great sound of that stuff. You know, even even someone like Curtis Morgan and Travis with Art of Flight, like, 
whether you like those movies or not, they have such a big feel and even mm -hmm. the music matches it, you mm -hmm. know? And like, I, I never knew who naked and famous was before I watched yeah. those videos, Same but here. those songs fit. Like I can remember the songs in my head when you sit in the tree, mm -hmm. like uh, riding up and off like four or five forties off that tree. Oh, like yeah. I can remember that song, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's such a distinct thing, and before even snow, like skateboarding, like the Plan B days and Operation Ivy mm -hmm. and and like Pennywise and all those bands, like I can remember those parts to those songs or those songs come on the radio and you're like ah, you know, like you I know that part it. Hensley or whoever it is, you know, the, yeah. to that to that song, but man, it certain videos nowadays it's just such a struggle although i do enjoy the fact of um people that have gotten creative with lower end artists and when i say lower end i just mean that they aren't big time and that they're the music's still um approachable from the dirt you know from the budget side of some of these films and and uh, you know there's certain songs that are bizarre what was the nicholas mueller movie that was a couple years fruition, ago? fruition, fruition. Yeah. the last song in that i i've never heard of that artist before but man it made that part insane mm. yeah and then kazu's whole movie yeah with he all had that, some crazy music all that japanese but it was rad yeah yeah yeah, it, yeah, it that fits. On that. yeah yeah some of it's a bit weird but a lot of it's it fit. rad yeah like, the thing is, though, with that stuff is that I'll not I noticed that uh, it might hit that initial watch, and you're like, "Damn, that was I, like that gave me a feeling." But the good soundtracks that are like just hits have rewatchability, in my opinion, because you're yeah. like you really associate that song, and you're like, "I want to put that song in my truck and drive up to the mountain." Yeah, like maybe I'm probably not gonna do that with the Kazu soundtrack, but no. it works. <laughs> but it works, <laughs> works yeah. for it. So. Yeah, and I, in back back in the day, that was actually a selling point, like <clears throat> to. <clears throat> I know that, you know, Mike with Plan B would reach out to Operation Ivy Rancid, whoever it was at that time, I can't remember, um, and say, hey, like, by your song being in this movie, it's now part of this culture, and these kids are going to want to go buy your albums, you know? And it was such a great way to reach, because, you know, the internet didn't exist then yet, so those videos were watched so many times, and those kids were just like, Plan B thinks that's cool, I think that's cool, I'm going to go buy that album, and now... Operation Ivy is now part of my repertoire of what I listen That's to. That's so true. Yeah. I still like parts movies. I don't like compilation movies. They're, they're okay. I, I do, you know, like, I think The Art of Flight was really the one big one that kind of started that, where it was like a bunch of guys' parts together, like jumping that giant crevasse, right? Um, but, I like, if you, I told Cersei at one point, if you just took all of Travis's... Um, footage from that movie and made a part that would get part of the year for that year true you know what i mean that yeah. all his footage from that movie was so gnarly but it like it was never even considered because back then you know they had part of the year or whatever from trans world and it was never considered because that was a compilation yeah, it was movie, a compilation right but i i enjoy watching a writer's work for the year put into a part that I can enjoy that we know the editing is done a certain way to kind of build up to the last trick mm -hmm. that the music is all edited for like the certain hits and landings and dramatic moments, or maybe they even stop the music, go to another track. And like, there's like a whole art to building those parts, you know? And it's funny nowadays, like I actually watched like the Thrasher channel more than anything because they still make those really well done parts and get, get some decent music, you know? But a lot of the snowboard movies, at least that I've watched recently, yeah, they're still doing some of the part stuff, but there's a lot of them have gone to like the compilation yeah. style. And I just don't get, I get a feeling from the overall movie, but I don't walk away sometimes like, holy shit, that part to that song. Well, and, and a part helps the marketability, marketability of a rider as well. Where uh, when it's just all put together, it's kind of harder to do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. So do you guys have an opinion? Yeah, I personally like parts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a snowboarder too, that that's your that's your your, your like, year's work, your, your goal in life. Like it wasn't like win the X Games. It was like get last part and like that 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 iconic like okay, I got like two songs I want to use. I got this trick. I got that trick. Like putting it all together, kind of piecing it together like a puzzle. And, and trying to create this video part that's your vision, that's your personality, that's your, you know, kind of, like, it shows through 
in your video segment, it, you can't really do that in a montage based s segment. And you do see these like 15 minute mini movies, but I think a lot of the people's stop process are, you know, people's attention spans are short. We're just going to make a 15 minute mini movie with our whole, you know, and, and more, we'll get more views. And so, I mean, as a, from my perspective, I think the, the, the video part will always be the Holy grail of, of snowboarding. Well, and 32 just dropped one, right? Yeah. And that's what they did was more of a group video, but then they gave this young am a part. True. Which yeah. really puts him on a uh, pedestal, right. mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. That came out last night. I think Chris was mm -hmm. was in it as well. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. And by the way, you actually have a medal from a specific part-based uh, yeah. concept. Games. True. Yeah. yeah. And I was actually pretty stoked on X Games for doing that because at a certain point, like X Games becomes kind of repetitive, right? And it is cool that they've over time developed different things going from you know, basic skate contests to then bringing in the mega ramp and stuff like that. But when I saw them start doing some of those video things, I actually gave them credit. I was like, shit, that's actually a good idea because you're taking a core industry thing and then making it a part of a metal process to where people get to go out and work for it and then award them a medal for something that is very core market of skate and snowboarding. Yeah, now so. this guy's got a medal. It's yeah. well, it sounds good on the resume. X yeah. Games gold medal. <laughs> X Games I remember gold I told medal my right I had told my dad I won. He's like, he's like, you, you want a gold medal? He's like, they can't take it away from you. <laughs> you <laughs> like, they can't yeah, take yeah. it away from you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, but pretty funny. And by the way, props to you. That was a red part. That was. Thank you. Where, where was that filmed? Uh, we did a lot in Japan. But Quebec where, City. where in Japan? Uh, the main island. So, oh, okay. Yeah, the North Island, you get Nagano kicked out of everywhere. So, yeah, it was all around uh, Schutzer Guide Rio. Um, I actually uh, for filming went it. to jail in North Island because they're so harsh. Yeah, North oh, Island, really? wow. they, they just, like, are over it there. Yeah. Just boot you. I had to write an apology to the president of the prefecture or whatever, like our whole crew, and they wouldn't let us leave until we sat in this weird little jail cell and wow. <laughs> wrote this. They're like, in your own words, write... I'm sorry. Like they told us what to write, and they just kept saying in your own words, and we were just wow. like, ah, but they let yeah. us go. <laughs> yeah, they're not wow. there. So wait, that like that's then west of Tokyo, like that sort of direction, like, or I'm, north? I'm going to say honestly, north, can, north of I'm Tokyo. I'm in the van. Like I don't know where I am. <laughs> I'm going to say about I'm one of those guys. It's four hours it's north. Sad to say, like I had no geographical. Just like I take me to this down bar over here, and there's a good wall I, that's in this spot book over Everything's here. Everything's kind of far away from each other. I don't know where we are, but it's about four hours north of uh, Tokyo, and it's the Nagano area where the Olympics was years ago. But yeah, he, you're just in the back of a van, and luckily the distributor like trash up to around. our knees. Just yeah, take me to the spot. Nice. Show us pictures. <laughs> well, take I, us to the spot. I mean, like, <laughs> like for doing that sort of part, though, I couldn't think of a brighter place to go do it as opposed to going to like. The dirty streets of Toronto and the freezing cold or something. Like, True. <laughs> the, but yeah, that was rad. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Well, how do you feel about um, getting into it? Oh, we're finally going to get into it? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Can you give up that pop? Name That Video Part is presented by the Dew Tour. Great event. They got the uh, modified half pipe. You see Danny Davis in there shutting it down. And now we're about to get into name that video part with Ken. What's your confidence levels right now? Uh, it's very low. I mean, the thing was, back in the day when I used to watch a lot of videos, I would be very much more confident about it. But, man, like, at one point, I think I counted, like, 25 snowboard videos coming out in one year. It would just got to be asinine i don't know what the number is nowadays it's low now yeah because <laughs> or maybe budgets There's are quite edits, different <laughs> a lot of web edits yeah. not a lot of solid videos yeah but you know like that's the thing it, there was really this arc of like you know in the beginning late 80s early 90s there was only a couple a year and then it peaked probably in the mid 2000s where yeah like 20 25 a year you know and it's like big companies like Brain farm and, you know, to robot food and and then all down to, like, really small ones, you know? So it was huge numbers. And, and it was one of those things, too. You're like, oh, man, they use that one song? God, that's sick. You know, the video could have sucked or just been okay, but you're like, oh, that one song that's 
so rad that they somehow got that, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I'm terrible. I even I thought about it on the right here. I'm like, I can't even remember what's in the Mountain Lab videos. <laughs> you, you could play a Mountain Lab video right now, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't remember. Like, right. I can remember, well, like, one of the opening <laughs> songs, like with the snow falling, Pierre being all artsy. <laughs> well, let's, let's see how you do. I mean, it's definitely a mountain lab. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Especially correct. the pole. Isn't that like a, a shotgun, like a skeet thrower? <laughs> that is Eddie Wall snowboarding down the hill, oh, yeah. uh, shooting a clay pigeon mid-run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an uh, NBD. It's never been done, I think. Yeah, I think it is an NBD. That whole line was super rad. <laughs> the line was so sick. Yeah, but that those videos, because Eddie and Travis Parker, like there, there was so much fun creativity going on with those guys and like rice would come and, and do rad stuff but those guys would just go there and sit like todd just come out and sit play video games what are we gonna do today just hang you know? and make it happen right and those are such fun times watching those guys go out like what are you doing who loops all right like <laughs> <laughs> and richards you just put the fish eye in his face he says a one-liner like get that damn car off the hill or whatever he's got <laughs> going yeah. on and it's like it's gold just yeah. gold uh we actually are expanding name that video part to name that in a rally car do you call it rev limiter still is that or what do you guys call it when it's pinned? yeah yeah rev limiter. maybe we'll call this section name that rev limiter okay <laughs> <laughs> it's a new one special for you um if you can name what uh segment this is from that uh, hint you're a part of um you get yourself a prize pack maybe here we go i mean it's a hood of and i can't Got two turbos on it. So it's either Climb Kana or Jim Kana 10. Climb Kana, that's yeah. correct. We're gonna, <laughs> okay, we got, one, we got one more for you. So let's see how he does. This is going to be, he might be batting a thousand on this. Yeah. Let's see. Don't blow it. It's a Subaru. It's a Jim Kana 2. Wow, dude. <laughs> You got any bonus for what that sound is? Well, I mean, the the backfiring is just me with my foot to the floor and it's banging off the rev limiter. But there's also oh, oh, that's Deerdick with the paintball. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dude, <laughs> all right, just crushed that's that. Hundred percent average. That was uh, get yourself an igloo. All right, prize pack. Filled it's filled with, with merch. bomb hole merch. <laughs> you got nice. yourself a mug, some sweatpants. Um, that's whole full sweatsuit. Oh, we got sweatsuit. Is it all packed in there? It's that all packed, packed, packed in, in there. the brim. Yeah. Nice yeah. coffee cup. Yeah. Chug some Joe out of that thing. Maybe chug some Monster, too, if you need to get <laughs> It's funny up. how the older you get, the more you appreciate coffee cups. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> I, like, I don't know if that's a feature or it just means I'm really getting old. Uh, we still have one more section of Name That Video Part for the listener viewer. If you guys know it, comment on the photo of Ken for your chance to win a sticker pack. Here we go. That's a classic. We want to thank you guys for playing a little name that video part. I definitely did not know that one. Me neither. <laughs> but I never do, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, going back to this, I got to commend you. I, I got to commend you on basically being able to conceptualize something and execute it. So, like, I have a million ideas. I got, I, I don't know if this is an, this is an idea I had. Just listen to this. Like, do you guys have a rev limiter uh, ringtone for Hoonigan? <laughs> no. Because I think th- I have a dirt bike one that's a two-stroke pinned. Every time somebody calls me, it's like, yeah, da, da, da. like it's just a it's a two-stroke pinned. So I was going to say, you know, th- you're welcome for this idea. But uh, <laughs> I think you guys should make a Hoonigan ringtone. So every time somebody calls you, it's just like the rev limiter bouncing. So, um, yeah, I'll send you an invoice for that idea. <laughs> um but going to keep going with my actual question, <laughs> do you have like a process for, you know, kind of creatively coming up with something and then executing it? Somebody told me that you have like a notebook next to your bed and you have a lot of ideas at night and stuff like that. Is that accurate? Uh, I mean, there's lots of process. Uh, uh, you know, 
I, I work with a lot of really smart people and a lot of creative people, but the, the, the hardest part of the process is we all want to do things. We all have personal agendas. We all have our own tastes. Uh, but boiling a lot of that down sometimes to things that actually make sense for a brand or and or affordable and or will have an impact, that's the hard part, you know? So opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. But it's it's about how to use those opinions to get what you need done, you know? So, you know, thinking back to D.C., there there's a million different ways that we could have spent money, but – we chose to do things like, um, you know, the skate plaza or love park or work with Stevie Williams or, you know, create certain, you know, videos, but it, it's all by choice and, and not everything's successful. You, you had not every bit of marketing that you create is going to be a success. So there is going to be losers. There's going to be winners and, you know, stuff like even like the Jim Connor video, like I, I had no idea that that was going to be as successful as it is. And shit, now after, I don't know, 13 videos, actually it's more like 15 videos if you count ones that have even been taken down, um, you know, over 600 million views. I would have never thought from that simple idea in the beginning that that would do what it was going to do. And even that, like I, I offered that video to, to Monster. Like, here's the budget for it. I can go make it. And they're like, no, we don't want that. You went and made it yourself, whoops. right? Yeah. That's a yeah. Yeah. Whoopsie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and that's why that was DC's. The first five videos were all DC's because I, I made the first one with my own money. And then I, I went to Nick that was running DC at the time. I said, hey, I made this. I think it's pretty good. Watch it. If, if you think it's worthy of a DC logo, just pay me my costs, which back then was only like, 30 grand to produce that video the first one yeah and i said look just pay me back for that dc can have it we'll put it up you know I'll put it with dc logos and he watched it and he was just like holy shit like yeah i want this so that's how that ended up being a dc video did monster get to see it too or just dc uh no they only they only they saw got the, like your business proposal maybe yeah they got a pitch of a couple yeah. ideas they wanted to do some marketing with me and we gave them several ideas and they passed on that one. You're kind of like, I want to make a skateboard part with my car. Yeah. <laughs> and so they were the, like, they just didn't get it? Yeah, basically. I mean, back then we were just trying to make marketing around what Travis Pastrana and I were doing with Rally because the championship Travis and I were racing didn't have TV coverage. So for us to actually get value for our sponsors to get exposure, we had to create our own marketing. So that's that was part of that thought process was creating that video. So it, 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 it's just one of those things though, like marketing, I, I have so many dumb ideas. Like it's just a matter of like sifting through all that and saying, oh yeah, my livery on a Modernica chair would be cool. Like <laughs> will people buy five of them or 5,000? I don't know. How many, <laughs> how many people want a Modernica chair? I don't know. So, so it's, it's, it's stuff like that. that it's, uh, it really is a process and, and a lot of it's experience too. Like, I, I've I've made books. We we made a Mountain Lab book that was part of the DVD. We made a DC book called Agents of Change. Uh, I made a book for Subaru about the rally team. So you know, like, but in my experience of books, that I love books, they don't sell. No one cares about books. So as much as I love making them, no one cares. They just don't do the right, numbers. Right. So I don't make books anymore. But what we do make is like. I no. guess I won't be making a photo book anytime soon. <laughs> Scratch that idea. If off you'd my like, list. if you'd like to lose some money, thank you. I'm, I'm really stoked we just had this conversation. I've been really wanting to make a book. Uh, Check that off the list. Uh, but I mean, a, a photo book though, done the right way and, and with the the right expectations. Yeah, you just right? got to know you're not really going to make a lot of money. It's a passion project. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's, yeah, it's framing it the right way. Yeah. But as a big company, DC, you know, you're trying to make sales. You're trying to do marketing. You're hoping like thousands of people will see this. And yeah. then you're like, oh. You're going to sell 300. Yeah, <laughs> sell 300. Like, that's not a success. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so the, the, I've had lots of different processes. I, uh, the little notebook thing you mentioned, I, I I used to literally wake up in the middle of the night and then forget the idea. By the time the morning comes around, I'd be like, shit, okay, I got to figure out a way to do this. I put a notebook next to my bed. And I used to live off these like little yellow like notepads. 
And like every day I would list everything I had to do. And to me, it was like a, it's like a, a feel good accomplishment thing, like crossing off a thing oh, on a Chris, list. Chris loves that. Yeah, Chris yeah. just got me way into that. Too. Yeah. Big list guy. Analog Big list. Guy. Yeah. And check mark. Yeah. So you I, would literally wake up in the night though and be like, yep. Yeah, so that's, that's what I would do. So I lived with these yellow notepads. So I, I don't, I don't quite have the same, like, uh, I don't want to say brain power, but the same focus anymore on that sort of thing. I, now I'm older, I have three kids, and my brain kind of works slightly different. But, man, I was so obsessed back then. You know, we were growing D.C., and and even when I started racing, like, I was just obsessed. You know, like, and that, and I think a lot of successful people are like that. You even had people on the show, you know, even Torstein. I was just listening to the Torstein um episode on the way here and he talks about like the obsession like he didn't couldn't think of anything else that was his life you know and that's the way i was with dc and it's the way i was when i started racing and and i attribute the success that i've had to that like i didn't know how to run a business right so i read books i i figured it out i talked to people you know i didn't know how to do marketing shit okay figured out you know i didn't know i didn't do industrial design i knew how to draw i knew how to draw houses well hell i can draw a shoe then and figured it out you know so you actually drew the shoes yeah i i drew probably the first 15 models that we had wow flew to korea and watched them get made yeah, and made sure they came out right full production yeah. cycles but i, I wasn't trained in that I yeah i had to teach myself you know and that, but that was the obsession. And Damon was the same way. He did the apparel for, for the brand, and he he looked at it the exact same way. And and together we did a lot of the marketing. I did more of the, the skate and snow marketing, the sports specific stuff, and the bigger mainstream stuff. But he helped, and all the the collabs. We were one of the first companies to do collabs. Like we did Cause a long time ago. We did Supreme collab a wow. long time ago um shepherd fairy you know um and that was damon that was damon doing that and damon was really rad with that stuff so the the mix of us being obsessed with what we were you know good at and turned us into what we were as a company uh that's so important for people to hear because i i know so many people out there that are like oh, I can't start a business, I don't know what I'm doing, or I can't start this, I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. You got people like, can they just figure it out, you know, and you get obsessed about it. And uh, going back to the DC stuff, I was randomly talking to Jamie Thomas on the phone this morning and randomly called me, which is awesome. Shout out to Jamie, I'm giving an air horn. <laughs> but uh, he told me that DC is owned, was owned by Fallen at one point, and he said that, I was like, you got any notes about Ken? And he's like, hey, uh, basically one time I went into this meeting with Ken and I showed him the line, and in 10 minutes, he was able to dissect all the shoes, tell me what changes to make, and he was 100% accurate. And I guess uh, what I was going, like, uh, what I was going to base my question on, is that based on, like, analytics? Or how did you how did you just learn what shoes hit, what don't? Um, are you a numbers guy? Or, you know, is that just all feel? or how? Well, it's experience. Yeah. I mean, Jamie's a good example, though. He came in with no experience. He knew what he liked. But he didn't know the numbers of sales, uh, you know, what worked, what wasn't working, that sort of thing. So, you know, I I oversaw all the marketing and helped in the product design area. So I was constantly interacting because you're marketing to sell, right? So I, I'm constantly interacting with both sides of that to understand what's working, what's not working, that sort of thing. So I knew that stuff very well. Um and back to the obsession thing and like a 10,000 hour rule, like, well, yeah, Jamie coming in with no experience on what sold, but he knew what he liked. He was very, he was very clear with what he wanted and he designed instantly a line that he thought he wanted to wear. I just helped make it better. And I, I'm not trying to take any credit for anything, but I could see where he was going with things. I'm like, ah, if we just pull this line back, if we put the logo here, we'll make the logo out of this. It just came from all the experience. By the time Jamie came in and did that with us, I'd already been designing shoes for 10 years. So it was easy for me to go in and help him do what we needed to do. Jamie was rad to work with. Cool that you had him on. I haven't listened to that one yet. I uh, always enjoyed working with Jamie. He's just a rad dude. Yeah. Uh, you know, not only like absolutely dedicated skateboarder at the highest level but 
just a great dude to interact with, to talk to, understood business, was a business guy. So when you talk to him about skateboarding and the industry and the process and doing things, he knew it from both sides. So I, I always enjoyed talking to him and working with him. But yeah, you know, a, a big part of that is understanding and figuring out business. And, and he said, yeah, everybody's got to figure it out, but you got to learn from your peers. A lot of times they won't teach you, right? Like, <laughs> because you're talking about people from other companies. So, you know, there's times that I would, I would go talk to like Fran Richards at Transworld and he'd say, oh, well, you know, Etnies is doing this and so-and-so is doing this. And, and it's just gleaming those little bits of information from everywhere you can because you can, you know, even if you don't use that little bit of info right then, it may be something that, you know, a penny drops a year later that, oh, that, that's how you do that, you know? And so it, it, it's really just a, it's a process and an obsession that hopefully will get you there. It's not going to work for everybody, believe me. Um, it's just Damon and I lucked out and we worked really hard and we're able to, to, to make it work. By the way, super random story though. I, I, I in the middle of us doing DC, like oh, a couple years in, I, I went, went, went toward Nike they had no idea who I was, what I did. No way. Really? Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were so, just like, oh, come on in. Yeah, but I studied that. Yeah. Like, I studied Nike. I studied Adidas. I read the books, you know, like everything I could get my hands on because they had a story of starting from the beginning and getting somewhere. So I, I read that story, you know, and what it took to be successful, all that. But I think it was Chad Denena from Nixon had some sort of relationship there. And so he got you in a Yeah, door so I went up there no and just, clue. Yeah, just walked through with him and <laughs> saw... campus tour. Yeah, everything that they were doing. And I think somebody actually... A little secret agent. Yeah. yeah. A little, yes, spy, think, a little spy action. Just notes here on my steno <laughs> pad, yeah. my little yellow pad. Yeah. It was funny that I think somebody actually recognized me, but it was like, they were like, hmm, like that, <laughs> that quizzical look, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know? <laughs> hey, what are you doing here? Yeah. Uh, well, but, you know, like I said, though, it's it's... You know, business is hard. People don't want to give you their secrets, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a matter of, you know, my business maybe being hurt by what I give you that your success becomes my downfall, you know? Uh, you know, there was a point in the early part of our uh, business where Etnies was making drawer shoes and then they even made our first DC shoes. But Pierre was giving us no discount. He didn't care. He was going to help us. He was going to help us out, but he was going to make his money, but not give us too much help because then he knew like we were just going to be You're fighting for the same dollars. Right, right exactly. Yeah. Which eventually ended up happening. We grew bigger than he was. Yeah. You know? So it's one of those things of like, careful who you help. You know? <laughs> <laughs> True. That's crazy. So, well, one thing I got to commend you on uh, is the fact that as you were kind of building all these brands you brought all your friends along with you right like the dc mountain lab it's like normally you take i don't know what the ceo of nike is doing but i'm guessing he's probably got his own mansion and he's not bringing all his boys <laughs> to come <laughs> surf or skate or do anything at his mansion what i just commend you for the fact that you're like all right i'm gonna get this this place to live but i'm also just gonna bring all my friends along with me right? yeah a big part of that though is like i Everything that I do, that I, I I like to go do it at a high level, and I like to have fun doing it, right? So, you know, some of the best memories of my life are riding dirt bikes with Jeff Emig. Or, you know, I can specifically see in my head riding a, a run called Magic Mushroom Bowl up at Tyax with Jamie Lynn, Todd Richards, and I think even Travis was on that trip. And I just looking down this run like – following these guys off stuff, you know? So to, to be able to experience what we're doing as a company and building these products, but then to be able to go out and and go to Ricky Carmichael's track and ride with him and hang out with him, that just nothing cooler than that to me. So, you know, it truly was, and it sounds so cliche, like live the brand, like, it, <laughs> it, 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 but it truly was, you know, like not that I could skate with Danny, but shit, he let me actually jump, the mega ramp with my dirt bike one time, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, you know, pumped around on it and it was fun. I couldn't do anything else, but 
it was rad to go out and experience that stuff with these guys. So I, you know, but we always did it from behind the scenes. The mountain lab was the first time it was starting to be like, okay, like I'm actually putting myself sort of in the camera. Damon and I always kept ourselves behind the camera, but, but it was, that was sort of one of those points where it's like, all right, well, living the dream is actually coming to light as a big marketing moment for the brand. And it, and it was really enforced by the retailers and, and the snowboarders like of it that were like, okay, this is a cool thing. Let's keep doing it, you know? But it was one of those weird moments where it's like, oh shit, this is my house. You know, like now we're going to take it and make it part of the brand. Okay. That's kind of weird, you know? And then we came up with the logo and the name and everything and, people really liked it so it really just became more and more about that but at the end of the day it was kind of weird because damon and i kept kept ourselves so far behind the scenes we wanted the writers and the product to stand out not us we never wanted us in front of the camera but that was one of those moments where it started to be like oh we there is someone behind us and this is what they do i think that's cool to tell that whole brand story like that's important people people latch on to a, a brand story along with that with the ceos the owner they they want to they want to like buy into a story you know and it's pretty cool you know uh, alex andrews and myself live here we have a cabin in uh huntsville that is in completely 110 percent inspired by what you guys did with the mountain lab so it's so cool and everybody compares it to that it's oh it's like a mountain lab it's like a mountain lab and it's it's not even on the same scale but it's, well the funny thing about the mountain lab though is like it, it's only unique and really snowboarding like, if you were like, oh, I, I have a house and I have a dirt bike track in the back, people would be like, yeah, who cares? Yeah, every you know morning I, mean? I had it. <laughs> right, right. That's a good point. Or yeah. like, oh, I have, a, I have a bar, like, in a curb in front of my house. Who cares? You know, yeah. like, but you, you have, like, a, your own private snowboard run for some reason. That's really that's special. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's really special, you know? And uh, that just clicked, and it wasn't, it, it was intentional, but it wasn't intentional at the level that people really liked it. You know, and I, I think that that was really cool. Funny thing is, Deirdre said something funny to me at one point because by then I'm, I'm getting older. Like, I like snowboarding even more. Like, I've now bought a house in Utah. I still live in San Diego area. And uh, Deirdre's like, man, I wish you still love skateboarding as much as you love snowboarding now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were doing stuff like the skate plaza and that's in the DC video at that time. But he missed me going to the skate park with him. I just wasn't doing that anymore. Like I didn't, I just, at a certain point, the pain versus pleasure point yes. of skateboarding kind of hit me. And I'm like, all right, I like snowboarding. Like, you I'm, can go ride some power. Right, it doesn't hurt at all. Right. And yeah. To me, the snowboarding, like the mountain is a giant skate park. I ride it that way. That's the way I look at it. And I, I I have more fun as I'm getting older on the snowboard than the skateboard, but still get the same feeling. So I skateboard occasionally now with my kids, but not like I did when I was younger. So kind of at certain times, I'm kind of torn by that, that I, I don't do what I did that I loved as a kid. But I just, I don't know, if you can't do it at the right level, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do a pop shove and oh, that feels good. Go to do a kid flip? Nope, can't do it. I'm like, well, all right, put that away again. <laughs> the worst thing as you get older is I struggle with this too because I used to skate every, you know, five days out of the week. Now, once or twice a week, in my head, I'm sick. Like, in, in <laughs> That's my, my head, problem I with snowboarding. Rip. I go to do a three flip and I miss. I'm like, I shouldn't miss that. I do that every time. But the reality is, like, you don't do shit all the time, you lose it. You yeah. Know? And skateboarding too, that, that reaction, that quickness, mm -hmm. if you. Don't do it for a week. You lose it a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. but after a couple of years, it's gone. Like, I, <laughs> good to know. I got to stay on it. Riding power is <laughs> like riding a bike. You just always know how to ride pow, a pow run, mm -hmm. you know, it's just. Yeah, natural. there's, yeah, there's certain things like that. You get on a snowboard and it just. You definitely can lose your grabs over the years, but yeah. riding powder is just dope. Well, the change gears, the thing that's very rare you see is like, you might see an athlete become a entrepreneur or a ceo or brand owner or whatever but you took kind of the opposite approach where you're like brand owner turned athlete and i kind of want to talk about the fact that like you basically just bet on yourself right like you funded your own career for to an extent right yeah and it, yes it is a very odd thing and i that does get called out a lot no that's sick <laughs> i think it's it's betting on yourself is dope yeah uh 
Because it's it's it is yeah it's much more common yeah for a Michael Jordan to go start in high school go be successful at the pro level eventually you get to a certain age and you slow down and then you go retire and focus on the shoes or whatever you're gonna do and I and I went the opposite direction it it, it definitely wasn't it wasn't on purpose you know like I I went and took a rally school in 2004 just for fun Travis Pastrana was doing some rallies. And it just woke me up to the fact that rally even existed in the States. I didn't even know it existed in the States. And come to find out there's a whole championship and there's schools and everything. I'm like, is that the O'Neill school? Yeah. So Tim O'Neill has this school up in New Hampshire, Littleton, Littleton, New Hampshire. Um, and so I went to that and just all my dreams come true of like watching Colin McRae and the group B days in the eighties and all this stuff. I finally got in a car and, Got to rip this thing around, and I actually did a like an extended school, so I I did like a couple of days in a two wheel drive class, and then I had contacted the team that was running the car for Travis, a company called Vermont Sports Car, and said, "Hey, if I get to a certain level, can you bring out like the Group N Subaru all wheel drive car for me to try? Because might as well, if I'm going to do this, might as well try it, you know, the maximum level." just for fun. Cause I, at that point I had no idea of going on any further than that. So they brought out the car and I did that and I just was in love with it from the first moment, especially once I got in that higher level car and, uh, it, it just like, I couldn't get away from the thought of getting back in the car after the school. So I eventually did a, did a race that year. I did one race, um, crashed out of it like a bunch of cars crashed on the same bad like kind of over crest and you had to stay right or else there was a a rock you hit on the inside of a corner but you couldn't see it so the first time i came through that stage like five cars were crashed out there so that everyone slowed you down and i made it through and the next time i came through there were no one there so i came over the crest nailed the same rock everybody had hit the time oh. before <laughs> <laughs> But even though I only made like four stages of that race, I was like seventh overall. And I was like, holy crap, this is fun. Like, this is insane at the same time. Can't wait to do this again. So I worked out a deal with Vermont Sports Car to to race a Subaru Group N car for the next year as Travis's teammate, um, doing the whole Rally America Championship, which was, I think, was nine events. And it was incredible. I was racing with Travis Pastrana, racing against him. There was a, a former world champion racing in the championship with us, Stig Blumquist. There was a great national championship from Canada. Um, Pat, wow, can I not remember Pat's name off the top of my head? Uh, I'll remember eventually. Um, so he was racing. So it was just a great championship, a lot of fun. Uh, and I ended up beating Travis in the overall points that year in the championship. We were both a mess, like driving way too hard and crashing cars and stuff. But it was it was incredible. I think I ended up like third or fourth overall, and he was one position behind me. Um, and from there, I was just hooked. You know, I was paying for my own. Like you said, I was investing in myself. Yeah, to go out and race a car. You know, there's you know millions of drivers around the world right now paying for their own. You know time to go out and race these cars, right? And I was just doing the same thing everybody else was doing. There was literally two, maybe three drivers in that championship that had any type of sponsorship that was paying for it. And Travis being probably one of two that had the entire thing paid for. Um, so I looked at it as like, oh, well, I'm just enjoying this. You know, we started making some marketing with DC around it. And and uh, anyway, the, the next year I, I won like my first national rally. So Travis hadn't even won a national rally, so I'd actually beat him to the first win column. And uh, he ended up beating me that year in the championship, but I, I got the first win thing on him. And uh, it was just a blast. It was just a great way to kind of start a career doing that and enjoying it. And from there on, it, it just kind of escalated. I, I kind of started putting in the time to get better and better. So racing extra races, going to driving schools, like I've done everything from like the Bondurant school that you would go to like in Phoenix to actually driving with a private F1 instructor in England. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I've done a lot to, to learn, you know, if you look at it and you say, I want to be here. Okay. Well, how do I get there? Um, 
Well, you know, it's really easy. Go learn from people that have done it before you. And so we just sought out those people to, to get that seat time and get those lessons. And on top of that too, I'd been around people like Danny and Carmichael and Rice and saw not only what it took on a physical side to train, but also on the mental preparation side. So I, I knew a lot of that stuff and was able to just start applying it to myself to kind of prepare for these races, to focus, to, to, you know, train. And then on top of that too, start developing the things around marketing to then be able to go get sponsorship. So I think in 2006 was the first year I started with monster. So I've been sponsored by them for, I think 15 years. How, how old yeah. are you? What? Were you like 36 when you started? I think it was, yeah, around there. Well, I was 34 when I started, and 36 was the first year I started to get some sponsorship. And so, yeah, right around there. Yeah. So That's people amazing. claiming they're too old can fuck right yeah. off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see, the, the, the old crazy cars is slightly different, though. With age comes a cage. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why a lot of dirt bike racers and people like that end up in racing cars, you know. Because uh, you're in the cage in there yeah. and you feel right, safe. I've, and... I've had some phenomenal crashes and, like, was snowboarding the next weekend. <laughs> which would be dead on a moto but do you think you grew up riding moto and i think that that ability to like read and process terrain really quickly and the and the motor skills and the and the rev limiter i do have to say the rev limiter it's just it's on a moto or whatever but do you think that translated into your rally? uh yeah I, I think a lot of the dirt bike skills helped me a lot like and and you saw it a lot with travis and i even when we would go to rallycross and do x games we were just on a different level. Like we understood grip and there were times I'd, I'd won rally cross races where the opposing teams like protested and they had to strip my car looking for traction sensors, like traction control sensors because I was so much faster than them on the dirt. They thought we were cheating. Really? But it, it's just, I grew up riding dirt bikes. I'm looking for the fastest line, but the most grip. And it's just something I've been doing since I was 12. You know, and so, they would strip your car down. Yeah, 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 things. full full strip down. Yeah, I dominated wow. this one event. I think it was in Charlotte that, it, like, Subaru was really pissed. Like, I made it. You know, I made them look pretty silly. And when it you was first got on Ford. Yeah, and it was it, it was just an event where there was a lot of gravel. I was just switching up my lines constantly. I was finding the grip, and for whatever reason, their drivers weren't, and and my car just worked really well there. We found the right setup and. I won every heat and I smoked everybody in the final and my car was stripped down pretty, you know, to the bones well, that's crazy. for them looking. <laughs> and that that's really common. Like, oh, it is. Yeah, you know, like from the bottom level, carding, you know, level of motorsports, there is cheating. Yeah. Like the saying is, if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> oh, really? Right? And granted... We do everything by the book, but you're going to the, here's the rule, you're right up to, like, yeah. it's not trying to push beyond it, like, and to argue where you're at on that rule, you know? Yeah. Um, I've never been caught cheating, because we don't, but, you know, we've definitely been accused of it, but never been caught, because we. I don't believe in trying to win that way. I'm, yeah. You know, I'm old enough to not care, like... But, you know, we've definitely, I, my kids race carts. So we're down at UMC karting and the kids around, like my the kid, my kid, my son's nine. And one of the kids in his class, nine years old, got caught cheating. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, that's what you're teaching your kids at nine? The, yeah, their dad basically right. was like, here's what we're going right. to do. <laughs> yeah, it's not even a national championship. It's just a local race in Utah. This, but he has to be the best. Right. Like, that's insane to me. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. Motorsports, dude, they got that. They got that thing going, and I do have to uh, commend you on the fact that you keep the audio in. Um, I was thinking about this. Like sometimes you watch a powder part in snowboarding. You're like, why is that kind of boring? You're like, oh, there's no, there's no audio. There's no, like at least when somebody's hitting rails, you got that bear like over the, over the lens or whatever. And skating always has great audio. And mm -hmm. the thing I love about the Jim Connor, I was sitting there, I was on a marathon last night. Rev limiter marathon, we'll call it. <laughs> and no, I, I do think that like in moto, sometimes they forget like when somebody does a whip, I want to hear the rev limiter. And I love how you just had such a good emphasis on the audio of the, of the cars in those. 
Yeah, a big part of making those videos for us is just making them as real as possible. Like, the talent and things rally drivers can do with a car is really exceptional. And we do it while racing. Like, I just looked at a video the other day from an onboard from a race I did recently, San Marino, and I went, ooh, holy crap, I'm really close to this particular wall. And I didn't even realize it when I was racing. But it's just we're so used to that, you know? And the handbrake turn and sliding a car, like, done in rally, we're doing it while racing to get through the corner as quick as possible. There's these hairpins where we got to, you know, get around this tight thing really quickly. So that whole skill is very, it's very particular in rally, and it's something that we're very used to. So with those videos, we just basically took it out of the racing and dropped it into a like a film part situation it's basically like a a skate or a snowboard part but done with a car and in, and in saying that though we wanted it to be as absolutely real as possible when you look at a skateboard video part or even a snowboard video part you never have like the guy just floating through the sky guy in the sky yeah, right guy in the it's, it's got to be the realest shot possible like everybody works on that long lens angle or whatever it's got to be to make it look as real as as possible you know you know i i I appreciate the the fisheye but i actually don't like the fisheye stuff as much you know even in skateboarding i like the longer lens look i agree even in that that real part where you go from the one fence over to the rail. I like the longer lens shot. Oh, yeah, that showed the distance better. Yeah, it gives you the more real shot Mm -hmm. of like, wow, you have to jump over those stairs and land on that other part. The fisheye doesn't get – it's a cool angle, but it doesn't give you that real sense of what you're doing. So Brian and I, when we make these videos, we we think of everything from – a perspective of like skateboarding and snowboarding and making everything as absolutely real as possible. I don't want anyone to ever think I'm cheating something ever. Mm. Like I'm never cheating anything. Like, and I, that when someone p- turns on one of those videos, I don't want them to think that this is a Hollywood yeah, there's production. There's no tricks. Yeah, this, this is it. There's, and you, there's, you can see how many tries basically do the, how many tire marks there are essentially. Right. Like, yeah. so that's the thing that's a trip is you look at, you watch these, the, especially the new ones. Like there's like, no, well, you know, one track, if no track, some of them. And, and one thing I want to talk about is the fact that you have kind of a camera crew and you have multiple corners set up scenes. And I imagine that you shoot at a corner and then you move to the next corner and the whole camera crew has got to set up, probably takes a few hours or however long. And you're just cold turkey and you just got to hammer it. You just got to, like, you're not warmed up. It's like cameras are on and then, okay, whale that corner, right? Yep. So it, 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 there's a big process to it. The driving itself, it takes four days roughly to make one of those videos. The driving itself doesn't take that long. It's the process of shutting down roads, setting up cameras, getting the right angles. And even if I do something, we look at the playback and say, ah, I don't like that angle enough, move this camera over there. So it's it's a really big process. And we we do this process because we... We like to make the highest level production possible. It started off very simple. You know, the, the first one was shooting at uh, a small airfield uh, down in Southern California. And we basically from there said, okay, well, this works. Let's keep elevating it, you know. And it's, it's, a, it's a formula for us. Um, and we're able to repeat it quite well because, you know, like any, you, you know, certain filmers and certain directors – they just have a certain look and a certain eye for things. And that's what Brian, Brian Scotto is, is the director of those. And he's my business partner with Hoonigan. And it's, he's the one that works with me that we, we have a very certain look that we want. And we just repeat it over and over. We spice some stuff in every once in a while, add a GoPro angle here and there. But at the end of the day, it's that money shot of like, okay, the car's two inches from that wall it's real. You can obviously tell we're not cheating that angle whatsoever. And it was really done with a 1400 horsepower, <laughs> a one-off Mustang, you know? So part of that's just really fun for us. And part of it is like, we just have this bar that we've set kind of screws us at one yeah, point. Right? Yeah. Where, where do you go? Right? But, yeah. But yeah, but it, it's really fun to work there at the same time too. It really is. And we have an incredible crew. We have, uh, you know, guys that, that work with us that have been filming, you know, 
and, it, and it's a big variety of guys. Guys, you know, one of the guys, uh, Magic, is actually a former rally champion in two-wheel drive. Another guy, Colin Harrington, came from wakeboarding. Like, you know, he's a big wakeboarder at one point, and now he does all our GoPro stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's a huge set of guys like that. And then you have Pierre, like Pierre Wickberg, who made so cool. robot food and did the Mountain Lab videos for us. You know, he's now nominated for a streaming on yeah, YouTube oh, for cinematography. Yeah. Oh, no way. Yeah. So, it, you know, that, that, that's a big deal. Yeah. So Climb Kind of 2 came out uh, was it this year, last year. I can't recall. I think it was last year. Uh, and so it's been nominated for the Cinematography Award. We shot it on this crazy mountain in China. Yeah. And, uh, the great thing about Pierre is Brian and I have a look that we want to execute and he's very good at getting all the filmers coordinated and doing what we want him to do. And then he adds his own flavor in when we have other cinematographers that we worked with, we've worked with like big Hollywood guys and they come in and they want to do their own style. And it's like, no dude, just, we want, this is what we want. This is what we do, right? <laughs> like, get this done. If you can add in something that we use, great. But get our look done first, you mm -hmm. know? And so some of those guys have worked out great. Some have been tough. But Pierre, we've used Pierre on the last couple things. Um, and he's just done a great job. Well, that actually brings us to another guest question from Pierre himself. Oh, well, so here we go. <laughs> Hi, Bumhole. Hi, Ken. Who is your favorite snowboarder? And uh, let's hear one or two favorite video parts of all time. He's feeding his baby. Yeah, I think oh, I hear really a baby was. in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Both those questions suck. <laughs> <laughs> Pierre, the, I hate you sometimes. He's putting you on the spot. Yeah, he is putting me on the spot. The problem with the problem with that sort of question, though, is like I appreciate so many different things. Do you know what I mean? Like. Someone like Tarquin, he's not my favorite snowboarder, but man, I loved that guy's style at that time. It was awesome. You know, someone like Palmer, like, man, like the, his style at that time was incredible in what he did, you know? But then you look at, you know, someone today like Travis Rice, it's hard to say he's not one of the greatest of all time because of what he's done and accomplished. And the stuff he can just manhandle on the craziest mountains is ridiculous. So it's it's a it's a really tough question. Plus, you know, I just I, I love watching skateboarding style and tricks applied in the weirdest ways to the streets, you know, bouncing off buildings and and using rails in such unique ways. And that that's what always blew me away about where snowboarding progressed to because skateboarding is kind of limited you can't build and do a huge you know winch to get 30 miles an hour to carve up on a yeah the side of a building 30 feet and up they're doing crazy and drop, stuff now. Through, drop down <laughs> through this weird hole in like a parking garage to like a landing you created you know like so that creativity is something that i i i really like so you know from god I, there's so many names that have done that stuff you know even guys like Zach Hale that I've worked with, you know, with like the Raptor Tracks video, seeing him kind of do that stuff over the years has been amazing. So, it, it yeah, that's a – thanks, Pierre. <laughs> 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 but at the end of the day, though, like at the end of the day, I like style. Like watching someone like Jamie Lynn go down the mountain, some days I'm just dumbfounded. Like I don't understand like how he looks one way and I like a – like a – dumbass next to him like, i personally <laughs> feel like there's a group of riders you can just watch them strap in and they look fucking amazing yeah, you know good. what i mean yeah. you're yeah. just like damn lucas magoon you just always look good <laughs> yeah. or justin benny, benny for sure. or yeah. jamie lynn and it's yeah it's just them man they're just style masters yeah and I, I gotta give a lot of props too to like the local guys jeremy jones you know and that whole crew that like there's a whole thing that came out of utah that was kind of unexpected and not only was it good on like a really high level but a really stylish level too like you know that whole era of jp to bj like it was insane what those guys were doing you know i'd still look back at it today and like wow that's really impressive you know and, and even even the breadth of it like jp you know what they were doing on rails and being creative with like the 
the little uh, the huts and stuff like at the rail guard to like what BJ was riding at Snowbird. You know, that that's a huge breadth of, of style with like a huge range of tricks and, and a way to use a board. And also the way those guys were presented by the forum juggernaut machine too, as a, as a kid, the way uh, JP kind of was on his pedestal for me, you know, he was, he was my MJ, I'll say. Uh, And we've had these comments on our our Instagram. (laughs) We did, uh, we posted, we asked like, who's the MJ of snowboarding? And man, people get really, people really get, angry. Yeah. It's like if it, some, like a lot of people say Terry. Great answer. Some people say Craig Kelly. Some people, but if a lot you of Sean White, a lot of Sean Whites. But if you don't agree with them, they're flying off the handle. People get really bent out of shape about this stuff. It's a fun combo, really. But. <laughs> I mean, the hard part about that is like it's hard to it. Style is something that's a personal taste. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can obviously look at JP and Jamie Lynn and say. They both have incredible style, but who applies better to your tastes is that's your own, you know? So that's a, that's, that's a tough one. Same thing in skateboarding. Like, do you like Niger or do you like John Cardiel? Well, two totally different styles and it's a totally different personal preference. Yeah. So true. Okay, so we don't really give a shit about chronological order on the bomb hole, <laughs> so we are going to throw it back to a story prefaced on Danny Davis's episode about the Mountain Lab, and uh, I kind of want to hear your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing about the Mountain Lab is, like, we had such a good time there, not only playing out on the snow, but playing in the house. You know, our, our, our dining room table is a ping pong table. It still is today. That table is still in my current house. Um so, you know, we're, we're, we're always, you know, having fun there one way or another, be it real simple stuff, playing Halo, ping pong, to, to have, you know, throwing parties, having a good time. I mean, MySpace Tom was there for one time for a party <laughs> to, like, Hollywood movie stars. Yeah, I mean, like, it was always a, a good time. and But th- those things were also happening when I wasn't even there, right? It's my own home, but, like, the team's there team managers there like nick olson's there running the lab for us and it was just a rad time so one day i woke up and it was you know i i had all these texts and i'm like well what is going on like way more texts than the normal so i started looking through them and i'm like holy crap something happened last night you know until the you know the one from nick olson was like yeah danny danny davis was here and hurt himself i'm like okay and then literally not much later than that was like uh burton called they said they're not gonna sue you and i'm like what? wait what why would burton be suing me you know so it was a really strange set of circumstances how the information came to me and uh anyway i, I didn't even know danny at the time like i i didn't even meet him till earlier this year so oh, wow. I mean, when did that happen? Like 2008 or something? A minute like ago. That? Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago, but I never met him. Um, but anyway, you know, it finally came out that, like, he was there, he was drunk, him and someone else got on, like, we had, like, these quads that we used to move people and stuff around. He got on that and started driving around the development. And then there was this one gate. He didn't describe it very well in his episode, but it was, like, a, a, a gate that just – it's one bar going across the road. And I think one bar from each side, and they connect and lock. Well, at night, it's like metal. It's not painted orange or anything. And so they're out drunk driving around and, and basically got clotheslined Ooh. by this gate. And so when I was told that, like I knew exactly where that gate was, what it looked like. I'm like, oh, man, I can imagine the impact of this, right? So... I felt really bad for the guy. Like I knew that he just won a contest. I knew that he was he was qualified for the Olympics, mm-hmm. right? And so I'm getting all this information about what happened, and I just feel bad. And like, but there's nothing for us to do. Dude doesn't ride for us. He's a Burton rider. I, you know, just happened to be there on a party mission, like hanging out that night. And so I didn't really think anything more about it because I don't have any, at that time I didn't have any connection with Danny. So anyway, I'm, I'm in my office one day and, uh, I, I, you know, from all the travel and everything that we're doing, like piles of mail just end up on my table and it can be everything from like, you know, random bills to magazines to 
letters kids send us, that sort of thing. So like once every couple months, I go through this pile. I just have to go through it. So I'm going through this pile and I find this letter and it says Danny Davis on it. And it's like handwritten, like on the front, like a kid would have written it, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, what is this? So I just open it up and it's, it was amazing. Like I can tell you, there's not very many people in the world that do this anymore. And it was a handwritten apology letter that he wrote from the hospital apologizing for what happened that he caused us to happen at my house and that he felt bad about it. And it was just an incredible thing that I like, I'm like, I don't even know this dude. And now I really like him. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I, I felt like he's one of those people out there in the world that like still gets it that, you know, respect and courtesy to other people that I fucked up at your house and yeah, here's he's my probably apology. Worried it might go away and maybe it's his fault. And right. That's a class act. Yeah, right I didn't yeah. know that. That's a class act. Yeah. Right there. So anyway, you that's my a class super act. random Danny Davis. Or, you know, I listened to, <laughs> I listened to the episode. He told a great story about what happened to him there and kind of like the real downside for him, the recovery, he missed the Olympics and all that stuff. Um, but I, I just wanted to come on and say like, man, I respect the dude so much. I got to hang out with him this year. We did that piece together where I drove the Can-Am and he was riding at the Peace Park at Boreal. You know, shout out to Gunny for hooking that whole thing up. Um, and that was incredibly fun. But the dude's just, Dude has so much style. Oh god, dude, he's and, so down to earth. So yeah. style. he's just a rad human. Yeah, he's a, he's a rad human. But he's one of those people that I watch in a snowboard. I'm just downright jealous. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, I wish I could ride like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I got one more Patreon question for you that okay. kind of corresponds with ping pong, actually, mm. from uh, Hava Fernandez. Um, hi Ken, do you draw any parallels between ping pong strategy and business? See you at Bald Face in 2022, Hava. Uh, wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> Hava always comes through yeah, with some of the most interesting questions on this show. <laughs> appreciate that, Hava. Um, I, you know, I've never really thought about it that way, but the thing about ping pong is, <laughs> well, the thing about ping pong is you got to be good at it, mm -hmm. but, but good comes in different forms, right? There's someone like Nate Christensen that like I've played a lot, but like, he may not be as good at me as it hitting the ball. I may have better shots at him, but his stupid serves like get me every no, time. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, beats, God he beats sneaky. me on the serves, you know? <laughs> so I'd say that that's one thing about business, that everybody has their talents. Everybody has their skills. And it's about using those talents and skills to get you forward or, or push the company forward or do whatever you're doing to the best that you can possibly do it. So... You know, Nate's skills are different than my skills. Does that mean he's going to be successful in a different way? As long as he takes those skills and uses them to the best that he can, then yes. Well, I love kind of saying play to, play to your strong suits, essentially, which is great advice. And I love the business advice shit. I'm fascinated with that stuff and picking your brain on that. And I feel like people learn the most shit from their failures. Like when stuff goes like it, it's easy when things are going great, but when things go horrible – that's when uh, you learn the most. What Do you have any particular instances of where you've learned a lot from a failure in business? Um, it doesn't seem like this guy fails much in business. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, from his track record, you know what I mean? I don't know if he's going to be able to answer that one. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, the, the, I've been pretty lucky, I must say. I've worked with incredible people. Um, I've worked really hard, but a lot of it's about process, trying to find, find ways to minimize risk, right? Uh, it doesn't mean it always succeeds, but it's also maybe a matter of the fact that you, you cover your bases by doing multiple things at once to sort of minimize the, the risks versus opportunities. So I, you know, not everything's gone perfect. I'll admit to that. Um, and I would say sort of my Biggest mistakes maybe have been um, because of lack of experience, you know, where, you know, like we, we went and started 8-Ball but didn't do trademark research before actually doing it. That was just a lack of experience thing. We learned from that, and every time we started something from there on out, the trademark was the first thing that we did. So it's stuff like that to learn from 
from things and grow from things as much as possible. But, you know, it's, it's impossible to know everything. It really is. So a lot of times you're, you know, I would rely on other people to try and help, you know, like when we went to sell DC to Quicksilver, we talked a lot to Steve Rocco. He was one of my only friends that I knew that had sold a business and he told me lots of great advice. So it's a matter of, you know, really trying to learn from other people that have done stuff before you and, and just try and figure stuff out. By the way, Steve told me something really funny. He was, he was, uh, quite happy about the deal that we were negotiating and he said oh that's good okay now start asking for weird stuff because <laughs> that'll distract them from the fact that you have a good deal <laughs> this was the dc deal yeah can we uh, yeah can we talk chatter you can, you can dodge this DC you know deal? we can you can dodge it if you want but you know i heard rumors a hundred million i mean yeah uh, i'm i mean uh there, there's that you can look it up publicly. There was numbers quoted, but that was only part of the deal because we had a four year earnout, and that was a big part of the deal. So, uh, the deal itself was over a hundred million. It was, yeah. Let's so, go. <laughs> so at the at the time we were we were doing about one hundred and fifty million in sales. Is it usually uh, like three times EBITDA or something? Yeah, there's all sorts. Chris, of you know what that means. <laughs> There's all sorts of different formulas for that. Um, but, you know, we were we were a very successful company, and we had a couple of companies come along and want to buy us, and Quicksilver actually gave us a great deal, and we uh, grew the company after the ownership from them from 150 to $500 million, So Because you were signed on after, too. Yeah, so we had we, – there was an earnout, which meant that we stayed on for four more years, and we got paid based on – the performance of the company and the company with Nick Adcock running it actually exceeded our expectations. And so we made a lot of money. Did, uh, <laughs> did you ask for anything weird? Yeah, of, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's, it's one of those things that uh, Damon and I were very lucky. We worked really hard. We, we paid everyone very well. And when we sold the company, 10% of the proceeds of that company went to the employees. I remember hearing that, like yeah. everyone, right? Like yeah. you could be someone packing boxes yeah. and you got your percentage. I remember yeah, hearing and, about and I, that. And the percentage was based on how many years you worked yeah. there, what level you were, what salary level, all that sort of stuff. Dude, that's but incredible. It, but it was something that we cooked into the whole process long before we were even sold because – we knew we had a good deal going, and we wanted to reward the people that were a part of it. But it's it's impossible to give people percentages of an existing company because yeah. they may go away, they may do yeah. something bad, whatever. You know, you don't so want to like vest their shares yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so the tr it was called an employee trust. So it was a great way for us to reward them, and and the, the athletes were a part of that too. So Danny and Colin had a had a percentage of the company, and then the athletes had a had a part in the employee trust too. What a cool way to do yeah. it. Respect on that. Dude, That's much respect. Yeah, well, the thing about us is like I, I, like, I was a skateboarder and a snowboarder, right? Yeah. Like I ended up with this company that was worth a huge amount of money. And, and I, it, it's funny. We worked with a, a guy that we partnered with, with the company. And as he got older and more confident, he turned into more of an a-hole. Oh, really? And as Damon and I got more experienced in business and got more understanding of what we're doing, we actually got nicer and more smart about it. And Damon and I worked a lot with just enjoying what we were doing, but giving back to the employees, giving back to the industry and trying to do our best job in a, in a in just doing it in the best way we could. And like, the word integrity comes to mind. I hate saying that about myself, but it's that's kind of the thought. Like I, I don't believe in doing shitty deals. Like I got to do a deal with somebody. Okay, what's good for you? What's good for me? Like let's yeah. let's do this together. Like I'm trying to get ahead of life. You're trying to get ahead of life. We're doing rad stuff. Let's do it together. Like instead I, of being like it's just business, bro. Yeah, right. and walking away. Right. Yeah. With like I, you, with I, like making I don't know leaving them with nothing and yeah, and, and I mean even I. Sorry to get political, but there's a certain person that ran part of our, ran our country for a while. And uh, and when I look at him, I, I see people that I used to deal with. Like, there's just this businessman that you see and you're like, oh, that dude's just out for himself and he's an asshole. He and doesn't, it sucks. He doesn't care. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And, like, 
when I, when he first became president, he was saying things and doing things. that I was like, Oh yeah, I've totally dealt with you in like private rooms making deals. And like, I would quickly get away from those people because that just didn't represent the way I wanted to do business. And I was like, Oh man, they almost enjoy the art of the deal more than making the money. And like trying to get something off of you, or just well, money it, it's and- not only the the deal and trying to get something on you, but the money is actually the scorecard. Yeah, right. Wow. So, and you see that the the way that he acted, you know, and and like there's I, I hate talking politics. There was things that he did I liked. There was a lot of things he did that I don't like. But that as a as a role model, I saw as just this a hole businessman. I, like to me, that's not a role model of what we want for our future for humans. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's an opinion. A lot of people have quite the opposite opinion, <laughs> especially a couple of snowboarders I actually know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it's to me, it's it's really it's it's plain. It's black and white. I've just seen it so many times. And there's there's people in life that you have the choice to work with. Right? Like in business, you can invite people into your life, into your business. You can choose to work with them. You choose not to work with them. And I choose not to work with those people. Right? And that's why I'm surrounded by the people that I'm surrounded by. And so when I see someone like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, not, not my life. Thank I don't you. want you in no. the universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, maybe, maybe that's the key to some of your success. That's awesome advice. Well, and that's, that's one of the things that like, I hate to use the word karma, but like you look around and you attract what you project, right? And so I'm lucky that I am surrounded by so many talented people, so many good people. And I feel like I, like they wouldn't be there if I wasn't acting that way also, right? And so you kind of get what you get in return. And so I I just look at it as, as a way to, you know, simply go through life, go through business and hopefully be successful in that way by doing things the right way. I don't, in, in my, in my, in my head, I I have no regrets of people that like, I uh, better watch out for that guy. I really screwed him over. Nope. None of and those. there's some people that no. have a laundry list of people that <laughs> yeah. better watch yeah. out for. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, the thing that's cool for me looking at you from my perspective is like, you, you got enough money. You're, you could do whatever you want and you still strive to, <laughs> be fast in your car and entre- entrepreneurial <laughs> stuff, family stuff. And I, does, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you, are you one of the people that kind of just loves the process? Because that's what I feel like I find with the pe- like a correlation. It's like, doesn't matter what you're doing. You just love the process of getting better or something like that. Uh, to me, there's two things. There's the process because think how much you snowboard, but then how much of the rest of your life revolves around snowboard. Right? Like the snowboarding actually is only a small part, right? Um, especially with cars. I, I how much I deal with the business of cars is is ten times more like hundred times the actual time I get to spend in a race car. So I enjoy the whole creative process. I enjoy working with people. I, I love marketing and I love everything that, that goes along with that. I've been able to work with not only some of the most creative people like on on marketing and design, that sort of thing, even down to artists that we hire for creating these liveries that go on the car from, you know, uh, guys like Philippe Pantone, who's a really high-level graffiti artist, to Troy Lee. So it's it's been very cool. So I enjoy that whole part of it. But then when you talk about it, you, you strap in – to a snowboard and you think I'm going to hit that. Like you want to do that the best that you possibly can. And for me, that moment isn't as great as it can be. If you don't put everything of your life into it. Yeah. You know I mean like, and that's what I love about getting in the car. Like I, I have a certain talent for it, but there's a, a big effort that goes into it behind the scenes. And when that works, You know, I just raced in Barbados and I was in a lower level spec car racing three WRC cars and I ended up beating them. They had a little bit of bad luck too, but if I wasn't there pressuring them the whole time and I hadn't put in my homework to be as quick as I was by the end of that race, I wouldn't have won. But I put in the homework. I was driving a car I'd never raced before 
And I did all the work it was to put me in the position to win that race at the end of the day. And man, I walked away from that race with some of the best memories of my life racing down some of those stages. It was incredible. That's awesome. Barbados, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Fuck. I bet the family was stoked to come on that trip. <laughs> oh, yeah, no doubt. And, oh, yeah, my kids are already like, so we go back to Barbados. Yeah, you want to race that again next year, right? <laughs> there, were, there was times I was racing down. I was like, oh, that's a monkey running across the road. So, <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> racing my car down the road. Uh, going back to some more rally stuff that a lot of the snowboarding people are familiar with, you go to New Zealand, you jump the car with Torstein. We talked about it on his episode. Uh I heard a rumor you threw some sandbags in the trunk to not go ass over tea kettle on that thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know what the dirt bike, right? Yeah, you like the way that the you take but, yeah, yeah, but the way you take off a jump determines sort of your initial angle. Yeah. So how much throttle you're using, the angle, the jump, all that matters. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the problems with uh snowboard jumps is they're usually step downs. So even on a dirt bike, that's a little odd. Most of the jumps are even or you're jumping up. But an actual step down gets a little weird because the bike needs to kind of drop down. Uh, but with a car, that's really weird. So we were having to compensate with that um, with weight in the back of the car. And I know Torstein talks about that in the episode. And, and he's talking about, like, he thinks that, you know, that we're just going to destroy this car nosing down on it. And then we throw some sandbags in and it's, it's all great then. <laughs> Um, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that, but, but really that, that's only a couple of years into me racing cars and we're still experimenting. And I had done a jump with Travis Pastrana out in Lancaster, California, where they, we went to this race, it's called rim of the world. And they had this little stage around like a, like a, a fair area, you know, like a county fair Mm -hmm. and they built, it was like a horse arena type thing like a big one and they build like a little dirt bike track they had a dirt bike track on the side and then they just made us like a small dirt bike jump like a tabletop it was like a 90 foot tranny to tranny jump and uh travis and i just looked at it and we're, we're both dirt bike guys we're like sure yeah it looks like third gear got it you know <laughs> and it ended up being this great photo of him and i jumping this jump and come to find out it was the local dirt bike track builder that had just come over and built this jump and he just built it based on mellow dirt bike transitions and and from there i just thought well that works here like why won't that apply everywhere you know so eventually i don't know six months later i jumped 170 feet on a tabletop at elsinore track the lake elsinore track that's actually a real dirt bike track i just we just put my rally car on it and i jumped 170 feet that's a lot of feet yeah, it was, it was sketchy. It was actually one of the biggest. It was one of the biggest Dude, rally. Just yeah, it was one of the biggest rally car jumps in the history of rally at that point. And Travis eventually jumped bigger, jumping onto a barge. Of course, he took it to some crazy level. Um, but it, I did it just like dirt bike track jump. Okay, let's do this, you know. And uh, I literally jumped so far. Like if I jumped twenty feet further, I would have jumped a flat and broke my back uh-huh. there. So I came. I got pretty lucky there. Anyway, fast forward to New Zealand. We were making that mountain lab video that year. That was one point five. The reason why it's called one point five is it was a crappy snow here. S- snow. It was crappy snow year here in Utah. So we were trying to film at the Mount Lab. Nick was blowing snow out there, and, like, it just wasn't – we didn't have a lot of great content from that year. So we went to New Zealand to, to film a part, and uh, I happened to be racing with a team that year down there. I just rented a car to do a couple events because the, the roads are so rad down there. So I paid them to bring the car down to Snow Park to just play around, and we bought some tires out of – Europe that are these skinny race tires that have metal studs in them. Never driven these tires before. Wow. Right? So never driven on snow like this before. Never driven on those tires. Sure. Let's wing it and try and make this video part. And it turned out really well. We did some fun stuff. Came within a few inches of one of the dudes. I can't remember who it was. I think it was a kid out in Australia, you know, and jumped the stuff with Torstein and Eddie and, and on, on the last day, there was this one jump I wanted to do. And uh, we had set it up to shoot some snowboarding on it. And I was like, I, I think I can do that. The p- 
problem is I figured out the mile an hour and everything, but with a, a like a dirt bike jump compared to like a snow jump, you really want to take off that's a little steeper and a landing that's a little mellower. So you have this bigger margin for error. Right, and especially with a car, you want a bigger margin for error. So if you have like a twelve degree takeoff, you want like a eight degree landing. Well, the snowboard jump was literally like fourteen and fourteen, you know, oh, something geez. like that. <laughs> so the margin for error, like all you do is go two miles an hour further, and you're way over here, or two miles an hour under, and you're into the face. Oof. There's just this really small margin for error. So I had this, I have this uh, calculator program that a guy that used to work for Snowpark Technologies under Gunny uh, made, and he uses it for all the jumps like at X Games. So he gave a copy of that to me, and I use it wherever I go to kind of calculate some of this stuff. So I had a rough idea of the speed, and then we were pulling Tor or someone, I think it was Torstein, at the jump to verify the speed, and he was like slightly off the speed. But, you know, you can pump with your legs. You know, you can pop. You know, and actually, as you go up the jump, you'll slow down, whereas a car will stay consistent. Stuff like that. So I'm all this is going through my head, and I'm like, at the end of the day, I'm just like, ah, screw it. Let's go two miles an hour faster and just hope it works. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it didn't work. So I jumped a flat and landed mm -hmm. on the nose and basically compression fractured my back. Ah. So luckily, we had a helicopter right there, and I knew, like, I went into shock and, it, and it, I was fine. Like, it's not like I passed out or I was in too much pain. I was in pretty bad pain, but I just knew my body went in shock. So something's broken. And I was able to get out of the car and get in the helicopter. And they flew me literally right down to the airport in the hospital. And they x-rayed my back. They're like, yeah, compression fracture. And I'm like, cool, what do you do? And they're like, nothing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, go have your doctor back in the States check that out. And so I had a flight like three hours later. So they gave me some pain pills and i just topped on the flight and flew home oh that's my god wild. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so when you watch mountain lab 1.5 yeah that's the last part in there and it was really fun to do except for that last moment oh people think with age comes a cage it's no joke but look at uh phil smodgy he's a friend a friend of mine do you know he, he's a nitro circus guy he's, mm. he jumped with travis in a razor he overshot something by like Oh, hundred. Oh, a long way. Now now I, I know what video you're talking about. By a hundred feet? Dude, yeah. he overshot the whole landing. Similar yeah. Sounds like he needs to get that app he's been well, using. Dude, he was totally, he's done. Like, he broke uh. his neck, and he's he's actually starting to ride a dirt bike again. I've seen some videos, but. I think like, they yeah. actually told him the right speed. I, I don't know the He details. just didn't listen. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's what I was but told. Yeah. That's a lot of feet to be going but over. The, even with age comes a cage, though, you still get, you can still, there's a high risk. Yeah, you got to be smart about it. Like, I'm not exactly doing normal stuff with cars. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I've put myself in these situations. Yeah. Uh, you try and do it smartly, but not everything always works out. So, it is what it is. So, randomly... I was texting Bodie maybe a few winters ago. I was like, what are you doing? And he replied with, I just foot planted Ken Block's head. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> True story. True story. Can you verify that? <laughs> yes. By the way, by the way, Bodie, Bodie, another very stylish snowboarder. Okay, yeah, let's Bodie's, give him an air horn. Bodie's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Creative, stylish, just Dope. Yeah, no, I, I work with. Planet here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and I didn't know him before that. I've known nice Sage. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sage, that was a little project that we did over at Powder Mountain with Ski Doo. Um, and I work with Ski Doo because BRP, I'm sponsored by Can Am. And of course, BRP owns Can Am, Ski Doo, and Ski Doo. So they send me all the Ski Doos I want. Um, and I didn't really sled that much a couple of years ago. And I just started started riding backcountry, and I, I've just fallen in love with it. Um, but back to Bodie, though, we were doing this little thing over there and coming up with fun little stuff to do. And, of course, Pierre's directing, so, of course, it's getting kind of silly. Uh, doing some cool stuff, though. We had uh, Carl Kuster there, who's a, uh, one of the top uh, Ski-Doo guys. Uh, and so we made this fun little edit. Um, but also, you know, it's funny, though, Speaking of Utah people, I never met Bodie before, another very stylish Utah dude. But, you know, that was one of the only projects I've ever worked on with Sage Kotzenberg, you know. 
And I met Sage at the Mountain Lab. I think he was 10. <laughs> you know, because him and his brother were like the rad up-and-coming kids that were sponsored by the local DC rep. And so his dad would bring him up and drop him off. And so they would stay you know, a certain amount of time, then the dad would come back and pick him up. So super rad to know Sage from such a young age and then watch him do what he's done in his career and watch him, watch him, you know, not only win a gold medal, but probably arguably, I mean, was he writer of the year? Yeah. Or did he have writer part? Writer of the year. He's writer the current of the year. writer of the year. Yeah. Right? And I, I think I asked him earlier this year, like, what means more to you? And I think he answered writer of the year, you know, because I, th I think for everybody, that's like the, the medals, like the un unattainable, there's only so many, but like the writer of the year, that's the justification, like in your core industry of like your placement of the best writer. Voted on by your peers. Yeah. yeah so I think that's deal. really rad. I really like Sage. I'm really happy for him. And I mean, once again, another dude from Utah that's got an incredible style and has been so successful. Something in the, the snow here, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of good, lot of good uh, shredders. Well, the one thing that doesn't translate, though, with um, amazing uh, snowboarders is most of them suck ass at snowmobiling, I've noticed. <laughs> and, and, like, if you, you can see the people that grew up riding dirt bikes, and they that translates better to sledding. Well, the thing about it is I, I grew up riding dirt bikes, uh, and so I'm really stoked to sit in this garage with two dirt bikes right here and, and a snowmobile. Like, this just makes me happy. Um, but, like, that skill coming from riding dirt bikes, the balance, the the recognition of grip, surface changes, all that has helped me so much in racing cars and doing things with Can-Ams. Like, a lot of things have translated from that. But also going and riding sleds, like... Some of it translates, but riding sleds is one of the wildest things in the entire world. There's nothing that actually translates <laughs> to the weird stuff you got to do to get around in powder. But it's so incredibly fun. I, I, I absolutely love it. And I love it so much that I actually bought a ranch <laughs> just so I could ride directly into the backcountry from this ranch, like over, you know, into the Uintas. From so, your house, you can get so, right into, like, behind yeah, Camus. so I know? really tell everybody I bought this for the kids, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> we needed space. We live in downtown Park City, so I need we don't have any space for the kids to play, but now we have horses and, like, you know, areas for the kids to ride the dirt bikes around and all that, but really it's for me to be able to ride straight into the backcountry with the sleds. I get ready, you know, get all my gear on in my own bedroom, you know, and walk out the front yeah, door dude. to my turbo sled sitting in oh, the front let's yard. Go. Oh, let's go. <laughs> we, we, gotta gotta drive, <laughs> we gotta drive like an hour and a half to get out to that zone, right? Do you yeah. you run pump gas to that baby or you go 100, 110 octane? What are we talking? Uh right? well the the sled I have now is the production turbo. Yeah. Was that so, eight pounds or what do they run on the Yeah, pump? I don't even know. Yeah, okay. Like it's it works so good though, because I've had the other aftermarket turbos on there, like like the boondocker turbo mm -hmm. and it's it's like all or nothing you know what i mean there's no low end in that like you can climb anything you want but trying to carve through the trees was a bit more difficult because there isn't as much low end power but now with the production turbo it it has some sort of bypass where it's giving you like a normally aspirated power curve like at the low end but then when you really want it and you get on the throttle it closes that valve and gives you the full turbo boost to give you that higher end power up the mountain. So it was too fast in the trees. Just, at first? just yeah. off the bottom end, it was just too much throttle. Yeah. Like idle, was, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It really, yeah. It just wants to launch it. Yeah. It's like yeah. trying to carve through the trees. <laughs> so, but I, you know, it, it, it like I, I love being in the mountains and I love snowboarding, but you know, all of us, at least on my side, it's like you're looking for those powder days. Like, when is when are we going to get to ride the powder? My wife is addicted to open snow. She just watches, like, when's the next storm coming? When's the next storm That's coming? That's awesome. But you go up on the mountain, and you get the day or two of good pow riding, and then it's, it's just gone till that next storm. But what I found with the sled is, like, I get that, that storm cycle extends two to three times longer now because – I just take that thing out in the bout country and I, I've ridden a little bit snowboarding from it, but I found that I love riding the machine so much. 
I completely forget about Chris, snowboarding. Chris does this yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's hard to get on the snowboard. It's so damn fun. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I'll be out there with some pe- people and they're like, Pierre, Pierre's like, oh, look at that. And I'm like, what? How am I? Like, like, I'm thinking, like, how do I climb up to that on the sled? <laughs> and he's thinking about, no, how do you jump down off it <laughs> with the snowboard? But I, I just don't even think that way when I'm out there with it anymore. The, so. the thing that's cool about motorsports that I, I can really envy and really enjoy comparatively to snowboarding is like, you think about the, the act of snowboarding. It's like, I'm, I'm hyper and I'm impulsive and I'm like, I get amped and I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. And you just get jacked up and like, you take your run and you're like, that was incredible. I got to sit back on a chairlift for eight minutes and then wait. And then it gets, but the thing about riding moto and especially riding a snowmobile, you want to talk about the corny ass term of throttle therapy. It's real because you get into a flow. It's continual. Like you don't ever, it doesn't stop. You're like carving through the trees and then you hook it right. And there's, you're just in like these long 10 minute windows of flow. And I can only imagine with rally too, but um, it, it's just like a different type of, of meditation almost as corny as that sounds is what, what I get into with it. Yeah. And, and I love to enjoy the mountains on a snowboard, but it, it's very, I, I hate to say this, but it's one dimensional in the fact that you're only going down. You have one option and even going down, you're like, okay, well that area is too steep and getting bumpy. This is too flat. These trees are too tight, you know? So you're finding the options of like the optimum way you want to ride the mountain, but it's still only a one directional down, but you get out on the sled. You're like, Oh look, an open meadow. It's totally flat. Like it's got three feet of powder on it. I can ride that. And then, you look over there, oh, I can carve up that, and then I can go down that, and I can jump off that, you know? So to me, it, it actually added a whole different dimension to the riding. I still look at the mountain like a giant skate park or like, or like a dirt bike track, you know? But you look at it, and there's no restriction to up or down mm-hmm. unless it's too steep or into a gully or whatever. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's added a whole new dimension to how I use the tool to get around and play. And the other element of it too, is I, I like the adventure aspect of snowboarding. You know, when you get on a mountain, especially a mountain you've never been on and you're like, let's go over there. You know, let's see what that lifts like. What if we hike out over there? Like, I love that element of it, but snowmobiling is that like on steroids. Like you're like, what's between those trees? I don't know. Let's go down that gully and figure it out. You know, <laughs> like, can we climb up that, thing I'm, i don't know let's try you know um so i, I really like that element of it where you i've, I've left my house at 9 a.m and come back at six and it's dark and we have lights on you know and i'm completely wiped out because i've just ripped all day long but it was a complete adventure you find one little pocket somewhere and rip that and find a jump and so anyway, enough about snowmobiling. Like, <laughs> I sound like a, a salesman, but I... I I'm, <laughs> this is fun. the same way. <laughs> it's, but it's still new to me. I've been snowboarding over 30 years, right? There isn't anything new I'm going to learn. I still enjoy going out, go to Bald Face and ride with Jeff. It's one of the best places in the world. But I'm still doing the same thing I did last year when I went to Bald, bald Face, right? <laughs> <It's> good save. <same. laughs> um, but snowmobiling, it's... it's just all new to me i've only been doing it in the back country now a couple years so I'm, I'm still like a giddy kid with it how many sleds you got up there at the ranch uh i think there's five or six with Ooh. five with ain't, five ain't on the no way <laughs> ain't, ain't no fun if the homies can't have yeah, it yeah. On, you know? yeah well i mean that's what we built that place so that we can have guests come yeah. out and and the kids and, have some and friends the kids and, and, and you know my daughter's 14 five more on the way uh yeah we have two <laughs> new kid sleds coming and still six hundred uh yeah i think so and that's what i should get a kid sled yeah and then we have i uh, take it easy back there three of the newest models from ski do on the way out and we just built a dirt bike track and now with snow on that totally do those doubles in like oh, wow. in tabletops oh with the God. sled yeah. Hat. Hat. yeah you know what's nice about jumping a sled is you don't have to pull the clutch in and yep. it's just one break yeah there's no front break well not that you use that anyway in the jr but it's just the level it out is just yeah well also another thing too with the dirt bike track it's very specific about the route that you go because there's bushes there's rocks 
it's all very specific on a dirt bike track. But once you get three feet of snow on that, well, there's I can already see totally different transition you possi- any which way you possibilities, want. Yeah. right? Like so, I'm super excited about that. Can't wait. I've done a couple of the jumps already with the sled. We got you know like a foot of snow two weeks ago. Oh, you've already done it a little bit. Yeah, I've done a couple of the jumps already. I'm itching to do more, but it just was just enough to like really screw you up if you, <laughs> yeah. if you got something wrong because there's still dirt underneath there and rocks that you could hit pretty easy. Before we wrap this thing up, I kind of want to do one more little deep dive into the Jim Gymkhana stuff and just the impact that that's had and yep. numbers and all that stuff. Yeah, well, the thing about that is like I, I didn't set out to – create like a viral series it was just a matter of trying to make marketing with dc you know to sell products sell shoes sell team gear that sort of thing and it it just took off in such a way that like i I didn't have any perspective to because back then like when we originally put the gymkhana video up we didn't even put it on youtube i had my own video player on my own site and dc didn't even have a video player really so we put it on my site because i had a good player and that just shows how early this was. YouTube existed, but it was like real simple, short, viral videos and that sort of thing. It wasn't the thing it is today. Right. So it, it, it's hard to put it in perspective, but it really was that long ago that like YouTube wasn't the juggernaut that it is now. You didn't just think, oh, that's got to go there. So we put it up on my site and within a month it had 10 million views and crashed this, your site. Right. Well, it didn't crash it. What it did, though, was it cost like, I can't remember. It was a really astronomical number because we were paying for data downloads. And this was a big file. It was up there at a really high resolution. We'd created it in high resolution. So it was sitting there on the internet at a high resolution. So every time someone watched it, it was this big download. And so I, I'd say it was like 10 grand a month in just data for that video to be existing on my site. Holy shit. Yeah, it might have even been more. So it did like 10 million. God, I have to say it was it was more than that. 100 grand sounds ridiculous, but it I kind of think it was that much because I went to like Subaru and just said, hey, look, this is really benefiting you. <laughs> this is like 10 million views in a month. If you want this to continue and not lose this number because it looks really good for you for marketing, I kind of need someone to pay for that. Otherwise, I'm just going to take it down. And that's really, that shows also like how YouTube wasn't even in the mindset. Yeah. Right? Um, So anyway, we eventually put it on YouTube and that video, I don't know, got uh, 20 million views or something on YouTube. But that original 10 million was just such a shock to us. And this number that we were having to pay for data was such a shock. But it really just showed that like, wow, this content, there's something here to this. Viral before viral was viral, really, it sounds like. Yeah, and like, and all my sponsors were like, really, this is cool. When are you doing this again? How many did you get? Like, it was such a boon to everybody. Like, Monster, you know, Subaru, DC, they all thought, wow, like, you've got something here. Yeah, keep making these. So we actually made Jim Connor 2 not too much longer. It was, like, within eight months or a year, we made Jim Connor 2, and that one instantly went to YouTube, and there was a whole different process that went to that because we said, okay, there, we got something here. Now let's control this. Let's market it. Uh, you know, Let's use this actually for marketing. That's why it's actually called an infomercial. Um, and it was a lot of fun to do, and that one instantly had like the same success. Now the weird thing to note about this is at that time, you know, Rally was like a new thing. So not only were Travis and I doing the X Games thing, we were selling product, we were creating these viral videos, and DC was just like, holy crap, you guys are getting us so much marketing exposure. And at that point, too, like at uh, like Pac Sun and Tilly's, like my team gear had dropped in there. And uh, because of the combination of these videos doing so well and it being so unique, we sold like 200,000 t-shirts of mine in one year. Wow. And like 100,000 pairs of shoes. You it say 200,000? 200,000. I had the Woo! biggest royalty checks of any athlete ever at DC. 
Wow, dude. And it of was, your own company right, that you was, sold for right, over $100 million. <laughs> Right. So it was really bizarre for me because, you know, we had guys from Danny Way to Ricky Carmichael that we made product for all these guys that we sold trying to reach these sort of numbers. And then all of a sudden I made this video, two videos, and we were selling outside like 10 to 1. Like on product. That's so It cool. was so bizarre. It was really a weird moment. I mean, did you for ever me. think you'd get to 650 or six? Yes. Yeah, you guys are going to hit a billion million. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. No, I never had any sort of idea. I mean, that's for anyone on YouTube. Those are astronomical I, I feel, numbers. Yeah. And, and especially like when you look at like Jim kind of five, which is the San Francisco one, um, that video has got over a hundred million in, to have a viral video that's 10 minutes long, most viral videos that get 100 million, million views are very short, or it's like a music video. Yeah. So that's a very simple formula. Like, you're either Mariah Carey. Yeah. You know, <laughs> or you're Beyonce's like... Beyonce's new video, or, or else... Or you're the kid that fell off the dock and did a triple flip <laughs> and somehow landed on the fish. <laughs> that, like, you know, <laughs> That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, you were hitting the, the guy falling off the dock type of notoriety. You're yeah. Having cars. That's, that, to me, is the combination of marketing fucking juggernaut becomes athlete, though, because it's like then you're coming at it from your, your, your like, backstory is, is so much. It's like kind of reverse engineering everything, right? Yeah, and I'd love to take credit for everything, but I can't. Um, <laughs> but but I, I have a great team around me. We have a great process. We have... A lot of people with really good eyes on this stuff that help us. But at the same time, too, some of it's just luck. Like, I had no idea. that like, I couldn't, like, I, everyone's like, hey, come come up with the next Jim Conner video. I'm like, I can't. Like, I don't know what that is, you know? Like, we try all sorts of different stuff. We have a series right now that Hoonigan's doing. That we have an 11-part series where it's it's called Hoonicorn versus the World, where we're drag racing my Hoonicorn you know, versus all sorts of different crazy vehicles from like a trophy truck to a McLaren to a donk. I'd like right? to watch that. Yeah, it, it is actually really entertaining, <laughs> right? And the first episode in a week did three and a half million views. That's not 10 million in a, a, a month, but it's still quite good. But, you know, it's sometimes it's just you throw in a bunch of stuff at the wall and certain things are sticking and certain are not. And, the Jim Connor thing is just one of those things that like we've worked very hard at it, coming up with all these different concepts and, you know, reinventing the Mustang in an all wheel drive crazy format. And so we've done a lot of work to get these views, but at the same time too, it's just something that we lucked into that I wouldn't have had any idea that so many people would love to watch. It's cool to see the influence of skate snow go yeah. into the mainstream rally and see its success. And also, you sound like a damn racer when you just answer. You know, I get I got a great team of guys behind me. I'm just trying to get out there and win <laughs> races. That wins. You know, I'm just trying to keep it rubber side down out there. They always <laughs> think their team. You know. <laughs> well, I yeah, I I, <laughs> I do appreciate though the talented people. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that Jim kind of seven where we did L A. Like I, I knew LA so well because I grew up in Long Beach. Went to Dodgers games with my dad, so I knew a lot of those spots. And it was just like an insane thing when I when we go to make one of these videos and we're hiring like Hollywood production people that are scouts that are going to the city and asking for permission. And like the Hollywood sign, that that took like six months to get that permission wow. and it went all the way to like the mayor level. He had to approve it and push it through. And then it was approved in the middle of us shooting. Like we didn't think we were even going to get it. And like the third day in the shooting, it's like, Oh, last day. Yeah. We get to finally, we got approval to do the Hollywood sign. Oh, shit. And, and at that point we weren't even ready for it. Like, so we got a helicopter going. Pierre had just, Pierre was actually in town because he was working on the Raptor tracks at it. And he and I had worked a lot on the, on the helicopter shots in that video. We have an opening shot where it's tied on me and then pulls back as I'm driving along this ridge at Baldface, And we worked really hard on getting this shot right. So he and I already had kind of this idea of what to shoot and how to shoot with the helicopter. So I was like, hey, Pierre. So I called Pierre. I was like, hey, Pierre, I got a job for you tomorrow. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I need you in a helicopter to shoot the Hollywood sign. I trust you to direct this kid 
up in this helicopter because we needed someone to direct a filmer up there, right? You can't just let kid might puke or something. Yeah, yeah. We we had <laughs> it's a good op- in a helicopter. We had a good operator for the the camera itself and the helicopter, but he needed a director. So yeah. I needed someone with someone that experience. eye. So that's Pierre's actual first directing part on cinematography for us in a video was Jim Connor seven on the Hollywood sign part. That's so cool. That kicks so, ass. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been an insane ride doing that. Like I, it, I'm, I tell everyone I'm not, I'm a really lucky bastard. I had this great business career doing DC. We had a lot of success. It was, it was a really, if you look at a company and say, I want to design my business career to, make this rad company, do all this rad stuff, work with rad employees, rad athletes, everything, and sell it. Sweet. Like that's in a dream come true. And then I transitioned that to this race career. And not only have I gone out and raced and been able to win races and reach a pretty high level of, of racing, but then to have like this Jim Connor series and all the fun marketing stuff that we do around it, like that, that sort of career alone there is insane. So to combine those two, yeah, I'm one of the luckiest pastors. He, he might just be the, the MJ world. of snowboarding. Yeah, <laughs> he I don't might, know. yeah, he might be the MJ. I don't know. He owns Jordan. <laughs> yeah, uh, dude. And talk about being the what are the. To stay on this narrative of being the luckiest bastard, uh, I was talking to um, Pierre, and he was kind of giving me some intel that you know Lewis Hamilton, the F1 racer, who is incredible. And he was saying something about uh, him doing a backflip at Baldface. Is- yeah, that's on, that's in my I, I photo somewhere. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like Lewis, Lewis has become a friend over time, just interacting at different events, and um, he's he owns property in in Colorado. So he goes to Colorado in the off season and snowboards. So I, I talked him into one time coming up to, to bald face. Like he really wanted to do like the helicopter thing. He's like, I want to wear the backpack. Like, you know, <laughs> get out of the helicopter. I'm like, well, I'm I going to this place called bald face. Like come there. And so he came up and Jamie was there and Travis was there. So he got to ride with those guys. That's a, t- That's we talk about experience. that crew for a second. Dude, it was, yeah, yeah, it was Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. Travis and Jamie. Yeah, that was insane. So, you know, like it was just funny because I'm I'm out there riding with him and I hear him talking to Jamie, like, hey, can you where can you show me a good jump to try a backflip? And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> so so you know. He's a good dude. Though. I, I really like him. Um, but I, I also Kimi Raikkonen is actually one of my favorite people because like in the F1 world, he's got this one image. He's the ice man. He's this like quiet Finnish dude. Right. But like, you get a couple drinks in him. He's like any other Finn. He's just like Ika, like, yeah. like Ika and Larry, Ika and Larry and all those guys know him because like, he parties and hangs Small out with the world over there. Yes. Right? But he hangs out with those dudes in Finland. Like, <laughs> so when I met him and started to get to know him, I'm like, Oh yeah, you're just like fucking Ike. Like <laughs> you are, that's who you are. You just happen. You just happen to be one of the best F1 drivers in the world. You know? That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> we saw Larry in Finland last time we were there. Yeah, we did. It was yeah. awesome. Like two years ago. And and by the way, speaking of style, Ika. I give let's give him an air horn. Ika. I give up to Ika. I've been able to travel the world from, you know, riding with him in bald face to Japan. And even he did a funny bit with me where he did like a vlog with Pierre while I was racing in Finland at the WRC event there. So I spent a lot of time with that dude. He's a, he's a Now he's dude. a DCT manager, right? Yeah. Oh, shit. Major shouts to the <laughs> yeah. I, man. Well, I'll tell you what, Ken. I think we did it. You think we did it? There's still so much more to talk about. <laughs> well, we haven't we, even talked about Devin Walsh. All right, due to the, uh, you know, we may we may need to do like a five hour special where we get some <laughs> urinary bags. <laughs> we we saddle up and just kind of maybe do a tell all. Like it would be like a um, like the Hobbit kind of. You know what I mean? Of podcasts, three book series. No, I think this has been rad. I love talking about snowboarding. To me, like the the culture and the people around it's so rad. Like, you know, anytime you run into someone, you're in some obscure spot, like, you know who the snowboarders are and there's always a camaraderie there. Yeah, they and, instantly treat, take you in too. And you're in a weird location. Yeah. But it could be from somewhere weird and Rick Scranson, yeah. Norway or whatever to 
to, you know, somewhere way down south. And it's there's always a, a, a good camaraderie there and always a lot of fun. So it's something I I truly appreciate. I'm, I'm one of those, God, I'm back to the lucky bastard thing. I get to tap into these different worlds where I get to go hang out with people in the skate world, you know, and no incredible people there and get to do rad things. And then the moto world, like, you know, the whole supercross was here. The whole season ended here. And so I had Ricky in town and Ken Roxon, and they're all coming out to the ranch and throwing axes, you know? So I love the fact that I can drop into these worlds and do that stuff. But snowboarding to me is still, is definitely one of the favorites because it's just such a great experience to go do, go around the world, go to Japan, go to Hakaba, do this rad thing in the middle of nowhere, you know, but then be able to, you know, do something like this here half an hour from my home. So stoked to be able to do this, stoked to talk about it, and stoked to relive some of these rad moments. Yeah, we are so stoked you came yeah, and sat down with us. Come down from the stratosphere and come to the garage with me and buds. <laughs> we got Ken. <laughs> Ken in the booth. It's been a pleasure. Well, we- now you guys got to come up and see the race shop. Shh. Oh, yeah. see the see the ranch. Gladly take you up on yeah, that. Uh, you might you might be wishing you didn't say that. But uh, Chris we- will be there every oh, day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Ken. <laughs> well, what are you doing today? <laughs> thank you guys for listening, watching. We really appreciate you guys, and we will see you next week. Over and out from the bomb hole.